right, welcome, welcome, welcome. This is episode 309 of the Xbox Two Podcast. I am one of your hosts, as always, Randall Thor19, the man with the million, and I'm joined by the conqueror of Dragon's Dogma, managing <laughs> editor, Windows Central, streamer extraordinaire. Streamer. Yes. Yeah. Purveyor yeah. of articles. I, articles. I can't think of any more uh, adjectives to describe. Eater of Heinz baked beans. <laughs> yes. Lover of beans. We have I'm Jez Walmart. Corden. He is here as well. What an intro. That yeah. was like extra effort. You went, you went the extra mile there, dude. Yeah, I got, you know, you got to do that, right? Yes. Yes. What a week. Why a week? It's been it's been a really tough couple of weeks work, and it's like I you know I got it's bank holiday Friday and Monday for Easter in England, so now I'm just kind of like letting my hair down, and we're kickstarting this little mini break with all the fine folks in the Xbox Two community and the finer folk. Rand Althor 19, the man with the million mm. dollars in his bank account. I wish. My <laughs> bank account's about to take a huge hit next week when I go to uh, do my taxes. So. Oh, it's tax season. Well, yeah. you've ruined my break now. I was looking forward to a nice, chill break, and now you've just reminded me it's tax season. Well, it's tax, Thanks, season, tax season here in the U.S. When's the tax season in? Here, too. Oh. Oh, is it in there in the UK as well? Yeah, it's uh, first week, first week of April. Yeah, I got to do my taxes as well. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I don't, I, I don't have to pay the money until October though. So. Oh well, they want. I got to do, I got to do the tax return next week. They, they want their money right away. They're like, where, where, where's our money? Uh, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be, money? it'd be a like shame if something help, It'd be a shame if something happened to your kneecaps or your fingers if we don't get that money, right? Is that is that is that is that the, what the IRS does over there? Do they, uh, do they come around your house and kneecap you? They might. They might. Damn. But bro, damn. Um, bro, I gotta give a shout out to oh. Snowbike Mike. Ooh, because Ew. he invited us. For an Xbox Two takeover of Kind of Funny X Cast, which we recorded on Wednesday and I think is live uh, for everybody uh, yesterday on Thursday, you know, and Paris Lily just just ducked us once again. You know, I, I <laughs> the last time I was on Kind of Funny X Cast, Paris wasn't there. You know, we we were Damn. here this day. Hey, we'll talk to Paris. Oh, you know. Paris. Not there again. He, Paris just always ducking us, man. He doesn't want to. You know what I mean? Yeah, but, I, I don't know. I think Paris was on a secret mission to Los Angeles. Seeing the new Godzilla movie, probably. Yeah, chilling. Or maybe he's get to preview the next Xbox, man. Yeah, the, next the sexy, Xbox. white, adorably all digital Xbox. Yes, but uh, yeah, that was it. Was great hanging out with Mike. Uh, for the hour and a half that we had to talk to him about whatever you know he wanted to talk about, uh, and then there's, there's Paris in the chat. I knew he would be listening, and he says I pur- purposefully miss Xcast due to Rand. Yeah, he's always ducking me, you know. <laughs> I was like, man, it's gonna be oh, cool, gonna be on Xcast with with Jazz and and uh, you know uh, Snowbike Mike Paris. and and Paris, but no, Paris ain't there. Nope, he you know, said so. yeah, he purposely missed X Cast due to Rand. That's what he says. Yeah. Um, I was also on um, I was on Sacred Symbols Plus this week as well mm. with uh, Colin Moriarty. So we we're getting around a bit, getting around, you know, yeah, getting Do, around a bit, doing doing, doing the touring, mm-hmm. tour, touring in other places. That was a fun show as well. Um, You're even streaming uh, interest, interest on your own channel, channel as well. Yeah, I did I did some streaming on uh, my channel, the Jazz Channel. Um, that was really cool. I, I, you know, I just, I just, uh, I thought like for a lunch break, I, I play, play a little bit of Dragon's Dogma and a bunch of people showed up. That was really cool. Yeah. I, I need I, to stream more often. I hear you even got clipped by, by the sloth. Yeah, I did. I talked about some Xboxy kind of things, um, but we'll, we'll discuss that in the show. Yeah. Uh, other than that, uh, you know, how, how's your week been? Been all right? Been good? 
been all right. It's been all right. Dragon's Dogma beats doing a million guides. I wrote 40,000 words worth of guides for Dragon's mm -hmm. Dogma 2. So anyone who shared those will check them out. Thanks very much for the support and all that good stuff. That's all done and over with now. Um, moving on to the next game. I don't know what the next big game is. Uh, what is what the next is... big game coming out? I don't know. Uh, why don't you bring... Oh. Let's see. Uh, I know Stellar Blade comes out the 26th of April, but I don't know if Windows Central will be covering that game because it's a... Is it, a... is it coming to PC? I might do if it comes to PC. I don't think but... it's coming to PC, at least not, but... not right away. Um, yeah, I'm we don't to... cover PlayStation. I'm trying to think what is the next like big game... The big multi-platform game that's coming out. Uh, I know Hellblade comes out in, no in May, uh, May 21st. I'm trying to think what else is coming out between now and then. And my uh... Probably wouldn't do any guides for that one. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just drawing a blank. I can't think of anything that's yeah, coming out. South between... Park Snow Day. Yeah, that got horrible reviews. <laughs> uh, Broken Roads is coming out on April 10th. That's kind of like a narrative uh mad max kind of isometric rpg it looks pretty cool okay i Uden chronicle 100 heroes comes mm. out on april 23rd okay, yeah. been waiting a long time for that another crab's treasure which is a, a crab souls like <laughs> coming out on april 25th there's quite there's a few there's a few little games i think i think the next couple of months is probably going to be by catching up on the backlog shadow of the earth tree south mole says in chat but that is that's june that's a little later, yeah. So June twenty yeah. first, um, June twenty first for that one, I think. Yeah, so mm. I, I guess it's going to be hitting the old backlog for for a, for a month or so. Mm -hmm. It's going to be it's going to be a slow month, I think. Slow month. But we'll, uh, yeah. But as we as Microsoft ramps up into the the summer game fest season, because the Sarah Bond was already teasing uh, filming events mm. on Twitter today posted a picture of herself on the xbox stage with a bunch of tv camcorders saying that she loves talking to her team xbox so you know that's that kind of felt like a tease for an upcoming event of sorts maybe what kind possibly? of event? what kind of event do you think well uh, i don't know maybe it's another business update around another like we need another business update jeez Maybe it's going to be uh, another business update where they're like, oh, by the way, now, now welcome to Halo Infinite. Now coming to PlayStation 5. <laughs> uh, man. No, we're not going to go there. But yeah, there's, um, there's, uh, there's things afoot. And I think it's going to be, it's going to be a, a slow, a little bit slow, maybe for big news, big games. But, and then all the shit will hit the fan as we get closer to the Xbox event and, Hopefully we can find out, you know, more about some of those games that we've been waiting a million years to find out more about. Stuff like State of Decay, what the hell's going on with the Coalition, mm -hmm. Contraband, where the hell's Contraband, Perfect Dark, all this kind of stuff. You know, I want to see more Clockwork Revolution, I want to see Avowed, I want to see all this stuff. I want a launch date for some of this stuff. I want to know what I'm going to be playing and when I'm going to be playing it, you know? So there's quite a lot to look forward to, but I think it's going to be, it's going to be a bit quiet for, for, a, for a little while, but oh well, that's just the, 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 that's the cycle, man. That's the cycle. I got a list here of some of the stuff coming out in April. So we got Stellar Blade, obviously on PlayStation. Manor Lords comes to PC early access in April. Uh, Sandland mm. is coming to, uh, Sandland got a demo. That looks pretty good. Did get a demo. Uh, that is coming April 26th. Top Spin 2K25, Return of the Tennis Franchise. That's also coming April 26th. No Rest for the Wicked, which is something you recently just played. That's releasing yeah, an did. early access in April. I was going to record footage. I was going to record footage for that, but I wasn't sure if it was okay within the embargo rules, so I ended up not doing it. But mm. I did I did preview No Rest for the Wicked. It's a very, very, very good game. Shall I just shall I talk about it a little bit? Yeah, just or should we do Well here, I'll just say first? say Braid Anniversary Edition is supposed to be coming out in April thirtieth. Uh Dave oh, the Braid. Diver, PlayStation Port, uh Sea of Thieves and Grounded are also supposed to come to PlayStation in April. Well Grounded as well is supposed to come to Nintendo Switch. It's so nice of Microsoft to give to give uh, PlayStation some some games to play. Yeah, Harold <laughs> for the Harold Halibut supposed to be releasing April sixteenth. So yeah, I mean, other than that, you got DLC for Final Fantasy sixteen and Dead Island two. 
uh, uh yeah it really seems like a slower month essentially uh for um I'm I'm actually okay with this because I've got a massive backlog. You do. I've got a huge backlog, and I've got to finish Persona. Otherwise, you're going to troll me forever about it. So I'm going to probably hit Persona, and I'm probably you know what I've been thinking about a lot recently. I've even had dreams about it. Okay, what do I've you, even what had you... dreams about it. Mm -hmm. Starting over in Elden Ring. Starting Ooh, a new starting Elden over. Ring save. Okay, yeah, starting over because I got to I got to the Earth Tree, the big golden thing in the middle. And then I got burned out and stopped playing it for ages. So now yeah. I'm just kind of thinking, do I try and carry on with that? Or do I start, might as well start over, over fresh? Yeah, maybe I should. But that's so, just another yeah, game we'll that you started stuff. before me and I ended up finishing before you. Yeah, but Years I, before you, you. You you cheated, though. Oh, here we go with the uh, cloud save stuff to get the get the other two endings. Yeah, yeah it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't count as it doesn't count because you played it wrong. So it's cheating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I played it wrong. I played it wrong. Uh, that's that's on me. So, uh, but yeah, I want to thank everybody for being here on Friday, March 29th. This is the fifth podcast of the month. Sometimes these months have four podcasts. Sometimes the way the the calendar shakes out, it's like five Fridays in a month. So this is the fifth my fifth podcast of the month of March. I appreciate everyone being here. Do us a huge favor. Make sure you hit that like button. It's right down, down at the bottom Mash. of the screen. It's free. Smash helps us out. Like Smash that like button. Subscribe as well if you haven't already. And uh, yeah, let's get into some housekeeping so we can get into the show proper, Jez. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Manscaped, is it not? Manscaped. That's right, Randa. This episode is brought to you by the Spring Cleaning Champions Manscaped Trademark. This season, make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders in below the waist grooming. Spring cleaning doesn't apply just to the nether regions. Get the full grooming experience with Manscaped's signature beard, hedger pro kit, and handyman electric face shaver, which I use and swear by. I think the, the razor, the, the razors that Manscaped provide are the best I've ever had. Makes Gillette look like complete garbage. Honestly, mm. whether you're looking to craft your signature look or clean up that neckline, these are always the right tools for the job. Clear out that winter bush with Manscaped's Lawnmower 5.0 and watch your confidence bloom like the springtime flowers. Embrace the season and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our special offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code XB2 for 20% off and free shipping. That's 20% off and free shipping with code XB2 at manscaped.com. Nothing like a little spring cleaning in your pants. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yes. Um, and Jez had a nice fun. little, uh, we were doing kind of funny X cast. The Jez had a little like. Little little thing on his face. He was like, "What's going on?" And he's like, "Bro, Manscaped just took money out of my account." Uh, oh yeah, I I was really confused. Like, uh, I was I was in, I was in the middle of kind of funny X class, and then I saw some money went out of my account from Manscaped, and I was like, "Wait, what? How, how did that happen?" But then I realized that I'd I'd signed up for a subscription to Manscaped's um, beard stuff, even though I haven't even gone through the 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 stuff that I've already got. So. So that's on me, but yeah, they do have subscriptions, which uh, you know keeps you stocked and top the uh, top top when it comes to formulas and all that kind of stuff. It's very very convenient, and their their leaving beard stuff is really really good. Um, leaving beard conditioner, I, it's addictive. You know, once you once you've had it, it's like man, I need this stuff all the time now. But yeah, Manscaped's very good, and they've been very good to us. And everyone who's purchased stuff from Manscaped obviously really supports the show and supports us. And you know, Manscaped as well. They've been with us for how long now? How many years, Rand? It's it's, it's been it's been a hot since like minute, September right? of 2021. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been it's been it's been a while. That's that's awesome. It's been a while. So yeah, that's the the Manscaped stuff. And we've got some Patreon yeah, shout wonderful as well. people at Patreon.com/xb2 support us. Uh, make sure you get your questions in, and the uh, that thread has been open for a couple days now. Um, we're working on getting some extra guests for next month and all that good stuff, so we'll let you know when all that's going down, but we we do have some shout-outs here. We got Just James 93 Jay Peltier, Thurgus, Christian the Password, 
Book and Beard, Holy Dark Dot, Steve Sompy, James Wiseau, Trickster for Trade, The Grandest of Bip, Battered Haddock, Omri Dude, 52C, Ryan Kippel, Foreign Object, Mythic Marty, Moronic Donkey 99, Randall Thor 19, Silas, Eric Gregory, Elijah Vasquez, James Moore, Fantasticals, Halo is the Goat, Katriox, Bright Tundra 1, I Like Turtles, Justin Duell, Frank Marion. Mariano, PB Broking, Ace of T and Madison, Governor Grimm, DZ Huffin, Wagerman, Achievement, The Scarecrow 121, Darren Tropy, Prof JJJ, Ghostface Killer, and Wolfgang KPZ. Thank you guys so much for supporting us on Patreon and everything that we do. Uh, but yes, Jez, now that uh, housekeeping is done and over. Um. Your topics yeah well i want to well, we have super chats well we, we do but i want to talk about um i just want to make br- briefly mention i finished banishers ghost of new eden uh, oh because that's the ge- that was the game i've been playing the last couple weeks um I, i'm completely finished uh beat the game 50 hours did all the side quests did everything beefy game. yeah lo- well long beefy, game beefy game long game if you want to do everything right because it has a ton of side quests that you don't have to do because uh, you are they, are they worthwhile content though like sometimes like you do the side quest because you feel obligated but is are these side quests like really well, worthwhile like so like witcher side there's quests? like side there, so like on the map you'll have a whole bunch of things in, in the areas where it's like oh you there's a nest that you can clear out or like a lock chest that has maybe a piece of equipment the haunting stuff is this is the stuff that actually has more dialogue And that really extends the length of the game, right? Because you're trying to figure out why this ghost is haunting that person. And some of them are really good. Some of them are are prime side content, side side quest content, right? Some of them, maybe not so much. Uh, But they do add a lot to the game, in my opinion. Now, I'm someone who does everything. I didn't do everything in the sense of, like, let me clear all the nests and do all that stuff. Although it is beneficial to do it because levels you up and levels up your attributes and stuff like that so it makes the fights easier as you go along but yeah i I thought i i thought the uh, there was more of those that actually uh had a good story rather than ones that really just seemed like it was there to pad out content i guess not saying that there weren't quest that definitely felt like it was padded out content but there were some ones there that really had uh, you know, that would evoke like a strong being like, oh, damn, okay, so that's what happened. Uh, but you don't have to do it, right? Like just going through the main story, you know, it's 20, 25 hours. Um, but I did all the extra haunting missions and it took about 50. I I really recommend the game. I really do. I, I really think it's an underappreciated game to come out this, this year. N- nobody's really talking about it. Um, I know a couple people played it i know jesse at xbox era reviewed it and gave it like a like an 8.8 or whatever or maybe an 8.6 uh you know there's a lot of other bigger games out and this one kind of you know kind of came in underneath the radar nobody really talks about it but i wanted to give it a shine because i really enjoyed my 50 hours on it and then what did i do i played valiant hearts coming home which do you remember Valiant's Heart, The Great War on the 360? It was an arcade game yes. by Ubisoft. I, yeah, I, I didn't. I never finished it, but I remember thinking it was all right. Yeah, it was. It was a. It was a pretty good arcade game. Well, the sequel came. Well, the sequel was Netflix exclusive, and people were like, "What? Netflix exclusive? A, a Netflix exclusive, right?" And that's weird. It finally came to console this past, like, uh, I think last week. So I was like, you know what? I really enjoyed Valiant Hearts The Great War. Let me check out Valiant Hearts Coming Home. And it was like a two to three hour game, but it was nowhere near as good as the first one. Still, it had touches of, of what made the first game really good. But you can definitely tell, like, maybe a different team made this or whatever because it was nowhere near as good as the first game. Uh, yeah, all yeah, I, I don't know. But it, yeah, Netflix exclusive is kind of one of those things where, uh, and um, yeah, I like what like some of these tech companies are like, oh, we need to be in gaming, but we don't know how. That's right. like Netflix all up, right? Yeah, and, like apparently Apple Apple's pulling back on its Apple Arcade stuff. Like 
because Apple yeah, had it just like the game. rumors Game-Pass Xbox is pulling game. back on Game Pass, Jazz. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll you know, we'll talk about that. that but um, n- so I played that, and you know what? If you're a fan of Valiant Hearts, if you like that first game, yeah, I think it's worth checking out. I'm sure it'll be on sale at some point. I think it's 15 bucks. Uh, but if you did enjoy the first one, check out this one. Uh, there was also a Game Pass drop, and there was a game that came out that I was sort of interested in called Open Roads by Annapurna Interactive. Usually Annapurna Interactive uh, releases high-quality indie games, right? They're a really good indie publisher. And I was like, okay, well, this is supposed to be kind of one of those narrative adventures, right? Which, you know, I'm all, I'm all down for. Mm-hmm. Really disappointed in this one, Jess. <laughs> Really? Oh, why is that? It just, it wasn't good. It definitely, no. it, it has this weird art style where, I mean, it's got some, some good actors in it. Um, and then may, the, it's like a mother and daughter going on a road trip to discover some family secrets. And the mother is voiced by Carrie Russell. The daughter is, is voiced by, uh, the person who's actually playing Abby in Last of Us Part Two for HBO. I forget her name at the current moment. But it's the way it's animated is like single frame. Uh, it's really hard to describe. So when the when so you get an image of them talking to one another, but it's just still like their mouths aren't moving when like the dialogue's being spoken, and it really detracts from the experience. Honestly. Mm. Um, it is a shorter game and I just didn't really find uh, the gameplay you know trying to figure out the secrets or any of that stuff compelling enough and I was just as for a game published by Annapurna this might be the first one published by them where I was just like yeah <laughs> you got yeah. a stinker on this one I, I didn't really like open roads but I did I did Fair check enough. that game out uh, but the other game I've been playing because I was you know I finished Banisher, so that was my long game. Now I'm like, okay, I need something else to play longer. You know, I, I get some of the shorter ones interspersed here and there that I'm interested in. And I was like, okay, well, I do have some stuff I want to play. And I was like, I'm going to get to Cyberpunk. But it's like, I was looking at April, and I was like, man, there's nothing coming out in April. I was like, well, I don't need to nearly play it now. So what I did decide to do is I started Final Fantasy VII Remake. Oh, on finally. my PS5, yes. So, I am on... I've made it up to the point where I stopped playing last time, which was Chapter 9. So, I'm on Chapter 9 right now. That's where I stopped last time. Uh, you'll know this part, Jez, because I just finished the chapter where you're reunited with Aerith, right? Where you fall down into her church. Yep. Yeah, so I yep. just did that chapter. I think that's where I am on my second playthrough, actually. And the nostalgia bomb with this game, bro, that that is weaponized. It is weaponized. The the nostalgia nostalgia in this game is so completely weaponized. Because, like, Final Fantasy VII is one of my favorite games of all time. Like, if I had to make a top five list of games, Final Fantasy VII is on that. I've played through that game five times, right? So... Turning the game on and hearing the prelude play. And I just sit there yep. and listen to it. And I just like get this crippling nostalgia. Because then like my mind goes to 1997. My friends, what was I doing then? You're thinking of like the past and how like I was just like, oh my lord, this is <laughs> if you could bottle this and sell it, you know? <laughs> uh but well, it is. What's, what, what's what Square Enix is doing, really? I mean, they've they're bottling up and selling nostalgia. I mean, I was 16 when I played Final Fantasy VII, right? I was even younger. <sighs> but uh, I was I, little. I'm 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 kind of shocked from my memory of what I played of it. Like, it is really linear. <laughs> it is like super linear, and I I, I know like, linear. they they kind of uh, changed that with Rebirth, where that was you know open world, and you are just yeah. in Midgar. Well, well, that's that's the, that's what it was like in the true, original, though. True. It was it was like the the original Midgar section in in Final Fantasy VII was fairly linear, and they actually they actually there are a few sections you haven't got to yet, which um 
they do make it a little bit wider and more explorative. Like, um, but I won't spoil it for you. But there are there are there are some bits and pieces where it's like you you can do a little bit more exploration and the secrets to find and stuff like that. But I really love Final Fantasy VII remake overall. You know, I'm not I wasn't a big fan of the ending, which uh, yeah, uh, no, you told me. I, I don't know what the like. ending is. I yeah, you you don't I know yet. Been, um, I haven't been spoiled then, on the game yet, so I don't uh, know. And I am I think in the context of Rebirth. I think the ending isn't that bad actually now i think maybe i was a little bit harsh on it and let my nostalgia get to me a little bit are you are you much. a little bit jealous that i'm gonna go through rebirth before you bro uh well i don't know i don't know if, if that'll actually pan out maybe, oh you, you don't maybe think you that's won't. gonna pan out no maybe maybe you won't maybe you'll end up playing something else and then maybe it'll come <laughs> to pc before that happens uh, uh something tells mm. me that's not hey but uh they they were sort of uh, hinting that at least Final Fantasy 16 might become another platform soon. Yeah, uh, Square Enix is uh, Yoshi P, the, yeah. the famous Yoshi P. He said, uh, "What I can't remember exactly what his quote was, but he said something along the lines of, after they're done with Final Fantasy 16 for PC, they're, they're going to start looking at other platforms. Mm. You know, may, that maybe that's the Switch too, but you'd want to hope that now that they've, you know, sorted things out with microsoft that they're talking about xbox it'd be yeah. like such a mean tease if it's not xbox i'm pretty i'm pretty After sure all. he's he's obviously he could be talking about switch too but i also you know want to yeah i'm also pretty sure he's talking about xbox like whether yeah. whether that's this year or next year i i, I think final fantasy 16 yeah. is gonna make the jump but I'm, I'm, um, I'm intrigued to try that because it is full hack and slash, which it is. I'm not a fan of. But it is. I'll give it. I'll give it the benefit of the doubt. It's got some of the highest highs and some of the lowest lows, Jez. Mm -hmm. Some of those boss fights are absolutely incredible. But Final Fantasy VII Remake, I am really excited to get back to it because, like I said, I'm up to the part where I left off last time, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, essentially replaying things I already remember. Now, from this point forward, I'm on chapter nine which I believe there are 17 chapters. It's all new to me. I have no idea what's going to happen. So I'm uh, really looking forward to seeing how the story plays out. And if like by the time I finish it, if I'm going to be like, all right, straight on to Rebirth. Because my plan isn't necessarily to play Rebirth immediately right after. Maybe I'll play something else in between and then play Rebirth. But I just decided, you know what? I'm going to play Remake. I'm going to do it. I'm going to play Rebirth to get that finished. Uh, I was even thinking of like, we got Cyberpunk. I'll, probably, I'll definitely play. And be like, I was even thinking, oh, I might have to get into Yakuza. I was thinking about playing Yakuza like a dragon. Dude, I really want to get into Yakuza as well. Just because, like, I, um, you mentioned, we you mentioned, like, like turn-based games, do you? Uh, I, I mean, I, I've talked to Lord Cognito about this. He thinks I'd love uh, Yakuza like a dragon. I don't really have anything against turn-based games. Like I guess, I mean, I used to love turn-based games back when I was sixteen. Final Fantasy mm. 7, 8, uh, like Chrono games. Cross, Shadows, Shadow Hearts. Like, I was really big in Shadow RPGs. Hearts is awesome. Like, back then. Like, turn based stuff was my jam. I, I kind of got a, out of that, uh, you know, as I grew older, but I'm not inherently against that, you know. If Fair I, enough. And if they have a really cool story that drives it along, then that'll, you know it'll be all the better for That's it. So enough. there's just, yeah. Cause we were saying like, well, there's not really a lot of stuff coming, but it was no. like, all right, I'm well, going to, I've got, right. I've got plans for my backlog. I also want to finish Dark dragon quest 12. Cause I, I, I never finished that either. Uh, but here's the big I got thing. A lot of stuff. I if play. I go through and I finish the stuff, what happens if I decide, all right, well played Yakuza, finished cyberpunk, got through the final fantasies. What if I start and finish persona five before you? You're never gonna yeah. fly Persona. Yeah. What if I start and finish Baldur's Gate three before you? Um, that could happen. It probably will happen. No, I don't. I don't know if you'll gel with that kind of combat, man. I don't know. That's like that's like that's beyond turn based. That's like you've actually got to use your brain, you know, for that game. Oh well, um, then I'm, then I don't want to use my <laughs> brain. So nah, brains suck. Yeah, brains do suck. So that's what I've been up to. Looking for, I'll probably have Final Fantasy VII Remake finished before next week, and then we'll see what uh, what what uh, game we play after, and how I feel about this supposedly mixed ending to Final Fantasy VII. 
Um, yeah. I know we, we have Hazador in the chat saying, play Yakuza first, Rand. I know people say that because obviously it's the beginning, but I will say, Hazador, I just don't think I have the time or the patience right now to go through Yakuza 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, <laughs> uh, and then Yakuza Like a Dragon, and then Yakuza the Man Who Has No Name, and then y- Infinite Wealth Like a Dragon. I just... Damn. I just don't. What is that? Like ten games? I, I just could. I just wouldn't be able to do it. I talked to Cognito. I talked to other people. They all say it's a. It's a good point to, like a dragon is a good starting point. If you're not willing to go through all the seven previous games or whatever, because it's a different character, and obviously you would miss some things, uh, reference to previous events. I'm just. Yeah, I just, uh, I just, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I could do that. So, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, fair I'm gonna. Enough. Yeah, I, I'm kind of looking forward to the fact that this is. This is a this is a weird thing to say, but I'm kind of looking forward to the fact that there's no major game releases coming out in the in the near future because my backlog is extreme, and it kind of feels like for the last couple of years it's been nonstop, full on games you can't miss over and over and over and over no am i crazy the what say that again it's just it just feels like it's been full on with big game releases for the since like last year and i'm kind of looking forward to a break to being able to hit my backlog a little bit yeah i I mean you know going back to last year there was a lot of games coming out every single month and it culminated at the end of the year but then it sort of kept on going in january with like a dragon and like persona uh, like Tekken 8 into Helldivers and Suicide Squad and whatever else came out in February. And then March was, you know, like Final Fantasy Rebirth and a bunch of stuff. But now it's like you're looking at it, it's like, all right, it doesn't really seem like it seems like all the it, everything's. I don't even really know what's coming out like the rest of the year, really. I know in September we get to like um, Warhammer, I believe, like Warhammer 40K, Space Marine 2 or whatever. But. There's not really too much announced for the end of the year. I know Xbox has a whole bunch of games they announced, but we still don't know yeah. when they're they're releasing. We don't know what Sony's second half of the year looks like and nope. uh, all that sort of stuff. We don't know what basically anybody's second half of the year looks like at this point. I guess that would be what uh, Summer Games Fest is all about, right? So let me get some, uh, some of these Super Chats. So we got some questions and some comments in here. We got Jones Jones with the 10... At Rand, if you would be a YouTube millionaire, would you buy all the Pokemon games and throw them in the trash? Like your 4090. <laughs> At Jazz, would you sacrifice Rand for World of Warcraft 2 and why yes? Uh, if I was a millionaire <laughs> and I had money to burn, I, yeah, why not buy all the Pokemon games, throw them in the trash and light it on fire? Sure, of course. If I had, <laughs> I had the spare money to do that, yeah. Oh, man. Would you sacrifice, I sacrifice me Rand. No. for World of Warcraft? I'm happy with... I'm happy with World of Warcraft one. I don't think we need. Hey, I, I hear uh, I hear Asmund Gold was questioning your uh, your insiderness yeah. at uh, Blizzard, yeah, As- huh? You getting- yeah. So Asmund Asmund Gold called me a Twitter random or something. Twitter like, random, line. Jess Corden, Twitter, Twitter random. random. That's hilarious because um, I backed up some analysis from Bell uh, Bellula Gaming. I, I I don't know how to pronounce that, but. Um, he put out an analysis saying that World of Warcraft was probably around seven million subs, and I I asked I asked the I asked the source of Blizzard I was like, what do you think of this? And they were like, yeah, roughly on the money, you know. So it sounds like World of Warcraft's been growing again, um, after years and years and years of decline. So Dragonflight pretty much saved the game, I would <laughs> I think. And I back I backed I backed them up, and then he was saying like he I. I think he's got this. His whole shtick is that World of Warcraft's dying, you know. Um, okay. So it kind of go the the these numbers kind of go go against that narrative. So I don't know. It is, is, it is. is no, I don't know anything about World and of Warcraft. Did, did I did I not tell you about the Warcraft Battle Royale? You did. You told February. me about the War, World of Warcraft Battle Royale weeks before it was announced. You knew I didn't care about it, right? I knew you didn't care about it. See, I didn't want to leak it because it, it, they've been they've been teasing that for a long time, and I didn't want to spoil the surprise. But I knew that shit, man. I know my shit about Warcraft. I, I'm just curious if 
someone's going to send this to Asmongold so you can watch it on stream and be like, sir, hi, Asmongold. I don't know anything about World of Warcraft, but Jez does. Uh, Jez, mm. is, 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 is World of Warcraft dying, or is it doing better than it has been in recent years? Well, uh, you know, Blizzard themselves, they showed off some charts at G- was it GDC, I think it was? Yeah. They showed off some charts at GDC showing that, like, um, the amount of content they've been pumping into WoW Classic and giving people other ways to play has helped helped the expansion retain users in a way they haven't seen for a long time. So it seems to be on an upwards keel now. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we'll have, to see, we'll have to see. I still think the new player experience is terrible in World of Warcraft. And I think if you want to get new players, you've really got to improve that experience. But... I don't know. It is what it is. I still like it. I still play it. I come back for ahead of the curve every season, um, and then take a break again. I don't, I'm happy with it. I don't really need it to be anything else other than that. And also, I'm just a warlock for for life, man. Warlock for I'm life. Warlock, warlock for life, baby. Twenty years. Twenty years of warlock. Hmm. Sad. Probably sad. Now another <laughs> another Blizzard game uh, just came to Game Pass. Diablo Four, Jazz. Finally. Uh, Diablo 4. It's on an Xbox console. I think they even enabled ray tracing, I think, for the PC and console versions. I'm not sure about yeah, the console version, but definitely for the PC they did version. They did it on the console as well. They did it for yeah, the console. For the console um, now, the PC solution is kind of what I always thought they were going to do, but a lot of people don't like this. Uh, you have to link your Xbox account or your Microsoft account to BNET. And then being able to, and then you'll be able to play the BNet version of Diablo Four. But of course, people are like, "Hey, every screen's an Xbox, but this, but this version of Diablo Four doesn't have Xbox achievements or any of the Xbox features." So there's a lot of people being like, "Oh, every screen's an Xbox, except for you know this game, which doesn't feature any Xbox features whatsoever." Uh, how's how, is, is is some of that justified? Uh, you know, is this I mean, what we should expect for, for all the Activision stuff? Or they're just, you're, you're just going to, hey, you want to play the Call of Duty games? Just link your BNET account there and just play on there. Right? You know what I mean? I, th- I think so. Because, you know, I don't think you can get rid of Battle.net. Like, people really like Battle.net. Battle.net's got decades of legacy behind it. I don't think you just get rid of Battle.net. So I think linking them together is probably the best option. But, yeah, it does mean you don't get your Xbox achievements, but, you know. Activision is going to pretty much operate largely as a separate entity. So mm-hmm. that's just the way it's going to be, you know. But I don't care that much about it, personally. I know some people want achievements on everything, but... Well, I mean, um, it's, it is it is an Xbox platform, uh, you know, thing they give you, right? Where it's like achievements... As some people, you know, hey, like, why is, why is an Xbox Play anywhere? Why they why didn't they just make an X, a Diablo Four version for the Windows Store and just put it in there and have it play anywhere and all that stuff, right? Uh, but I think this was just sort of like a quick a quick fix solution. I mean, maybe down the line they'll bring them even closer together and stuff like that. But I don't know. Now it does. So correct me if I'm wrong. But if you do play Diablo on your console and then you load up with the same account somewhere else, it actually yeah. does take over. It, you can transfer your saves. Uh, you don't have to transfer it. it just it's just it's just there. it's just there. So so basically, all you, this all about, the save stuff is on about, is on yeah. Blizzard servers. Your your account data for ba- Blizzard games lives on your Battle.net account. So okay. same with Overwatch. So like I load up Overwatch on PC. It's all the same stuff. And it's the same for Diablo 4. It's all the same stuff. I don't think that's true for Diablo 3. Come to think of it. So, like, maybe there's still stuff they can do there to integrate them. You know, and if, like, some of the classic games come to Xbox, like, you know, I could see them do a PC version of Warcraft 3, uh, Xbox version of Warcraft 3 down the line. You know, using similar control schemes to what they put together for Age of Empires. Maybe they'll link those. I mean, there's there's more integration that could do and stuff like that, but you know, and but I think maintaining Battle.net has to be take priority, personally. 
but this is the problem when you get so big you become you become so big you've got all these different technologies that overlap and intersect and you know integrating them is not an overnight thing so like this this solution is probably the the quick one they could come up with so it's like either you wait for the developers to to do this in a way that makes it more xboxy or you do it this way which you know gets you into the game quicker i think this is probably you know more important get people into the game but at the same time i think they could have afforded to have held off a little bit and wait for season four because season four for diablo has a lot of positive changes in it that i think is going to make people enjoy the game more but then again a lot of new players to diablo they would probably be just playing through the story and won't probably won't necessarily care too much about the seasonal content anyway this time around but I don't know. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Okay. But uh, hey, they're de-emphasizing Game Pass, I heard. So who cares? <laughs> right, Rand? Right, Rand? De-emphasizing Game Pass? Isn't I mean, that what the rumor is? Yeah, I guess we'll talk about that when we get to that. <laughs> so, uh, Grandman in the Super Chat dropped us a two and says, Rand the man with the million dollars cannot hold 20. Of course you can. Can, can hold 20. Supernova with the five. Says so Jess, have you nominated yourself for U.S. presidential elections for 2024? Uh, I don't think I can do that because don't you have to be a U.S. citizen? You do. Yes, you do. So yeah. You would, so but you, like you can't. You have to be like. I don't think even if you acquire citizenship, you have to be born there, right, or something. You have to be a naturalized. Ex, uh, I was gonna say naturalized Xbox citizen, a naturalized American citizen. Xbox. So. Yeah, because Arnold Schwarzenegger, there was that thing where he wanted to run for president, but he wasn't born here. Yeah, like, he's a U.S. citizen, yeah. uh, but he wasn't a natural U.S. citizen, so he's not allowed yeah. to run for uh, the. He can, he obviously mayor of Cal, you know, governor of California or whatever, but yeah, he can't governor. be. He can't be uh, president of the United States. So damn. Yeah, I, can I can I be vice president? I'm guessing no, right? I'm probably be, probably sure you can't be. No, I'm probably that's could probably I be the, also. Could I be Speaker of the House? You probably could be. I run as a Republican Speaker of the House, so I'd, I'd get there, get in there eventually. They keep seem to change in them every every few weeks. <laughs> uh, we got a super uh, chat here from FBI humor. agent. He drops a two and says Xbox slash direction time for leadership change. I think we have the author of that mm. VGC article in the chat. <laughs> goes by the name FBI agent Phil Spencer what was, what was the the name of the article Phil Spencer is the credit is the man who saved Xbox will be the man who destroys Xbox or whatever it is definitely yeah. uh, a compelling and uh, title there compelling and clickbaity title there I'm sure it's getting all the clicks being shared around everywhere you're gonna have the PlayStation guys being like oh I love this oh, you know like just going crazy and then the Xbox guys which you know who even uh, there's not that many anymore anyways uh, uh they're, they're like what the hell's real going real. on uh i will say i i did read the article you know everybody's entitled to their opinions and who knows how the future is going to play out either way but <laughs> towards the end of the article <laughs> he said instead of spending 70 million dollars 70 billion dollars in activision blizzard maybe they should have spent that money on 230 games like spider-man 2 and i was just like yeah, sure. That just reads like a post that somebody made on Reset Era. And it's like, they should have just did this. They should have made 200 games with the budget of Spider-Man 2. That'll that'll that'll, that'll, that'll have changed everything. I'm like, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, RDX on a FET with the 699. He says, IGN's review of South Park Snow Day is bad. Did they even play the game? Three out of ten because it's not turn based. I guess they shouldn't try something new. Yeah, it didn't really. Yeah, not I haven't. Reviews. I haven't heard. I haven't seen many positive reviews of that game, but I haven't played it myself, so I can't really comment. I just kind of, I just kind of saw the press releases in my inbox, and I was just like, well, that's not a game for me. Mm. So, and I've got a limited bad budget to to cover games. Uh, Joaquin Branch with the one ninety nine. He says poopy scoopy, whatever that means. Hmm. And see with the two, any influence Elder Scrolls 6 or Fable should take from Dragon's Dogma 2? 
Hmm. Um, what do you think? Tighter combat, maybe, but that's probably it. <laughs> um, no, tight, I, I think Dragon's Dogma owes a lot to Skyrim. Uh, probably. You think so? But yeah, but I think it goes both ways. I think like you, like when I when I played Dragon's Dogma One for the first time, it was after I played Witcher Three, and I was just like, man, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, Dragon's Dogma DNA in The Witcher Three. So like I think like a lot of these sort of landmark kind of games, they all sort of riff on each other, right? They take inspiration from each other, and things get remixed, and they're like, oh, that's a really great idea, you know? Uh, let's repackage it. But Skyrim, were like, I rem do you remember the first time you saw a dragon in Skyrim? Yes. I, I was like, I was just like, man, how the how the fuck did they do this? Mm -hmm. It was like, it was like amazing at the time. Um, you know, the the, the 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 dragon battles, and it felt really dynamic and stuff like that, you know? And, you know, and we see we see shades of that in Dragon's Dogma, and we've seen shades of, shades of it in The Witcher and, you know, subsequent games and stuff like that. And, and now Elden Ring, you know, and then it's all cyclical, you know? So I would like to see, for me at least, I'd like to see Elder Scrolls really up the ante when it comes to combat. I think, like, the creation engine's melee systems... A poor, really poor by today's standards, and I know it's really hard to do first-person melee combat. But like after playing games like Dead Island, or you know Dying Light, even like Sky Creation Engines, like even in Starfield, like when you play with melee, the, the melee system just does not cut the mustard now by today's standards. Or even like the Cyberpunk, you know. So I think they need to do some work there. But other than that, I don't know. I we'll see. I'm I'm looking forward to the next Elder Scrolls, and the next Fallout. When when are we gonna get the next Fallout, Rand? <laughs> uh, Twenty thirty five. I mean, you're getting basically what would have been Fallout five with TV shows starting uh, in April twelfth. Oh. Although I think they're they, you know they mentioned they're saving some of that stuff, but hey, they're they're doing stuff in Starfield, right? We 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 you would imagine the expansion will be coming sometime this year, Shattered Space. Mm -hmm. But we did get an update on Elder Scrolls Six, Jez. Right? Because they were celebrating their 30th anniversary. And I believe they tweeted this out. They said, last but not least, yes, we are in development on the next chapter. The Elder Scrolls Six. And they've even, got the first playable builds. Even now, returning to Tamriel and playing early builds has us filled with the same joy, excitement, and promise of adventure so i like that playable builds early builds now in development when are we able to get our hands on this game jazz elder scrolls 6 god knows man god knows it's gonna be a long time i tell you what we'll de we'll definitely get get it before we get another fallout game <laughs> yeah 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 i want to see them improve the engine man yeah i mean like play playing like um even though like Starfield did some really cool stuff with its environments and you know, every now and then there was in Starfield where you get like to the top of a mountain or something and, and the mist hits the light in the right way and it's 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 breathtaking, you know. I think the environmental stuff is when you zoom out, it's really on point. But some of the, the character faces and and all that kind of stuff, it needs a lot of work, you know. So like I'm hoping that some of the some of the work that goes into the next Elder Scrolls is leaning on tech, but you know we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Elder Scrolls Six, man, it's been a long time since Skyrim. Um, you know, Starfield was what the king of the SEOs last year. A lot of uh, positive articles, but then a lot of negative articles from a lot of different uh, places, always comparing things to Starfield. And, uh, yeah, I'm just interesting to see how Elder Scrolls will fare in that regard because people love Elder Scrolls. But I'm, I, I, I kind of feel sad for you, Jez, honestly, though. Why is that? Cause you I feel sad for me, too, but why? Because you're not getting a Fallout until another 10 years from now, 11 years from uh, now. Yeah, but hopefully I'll have the, uh, the Outer Worlds 2 to tide me over. Yeah, they really should just spin up a new studio or a team to make another fallout game and i know it's like obsidian's it's there negligent man it's negligent to not negligent it's neg yeah i mean 
Obsidian would be the dream, right? But Obsidian's got a lot of its own stuff going on, and you know they're working on the Outer Worlds too, and I completely appreciate that. You know, if they're work, working on what they want to work on, but in that context, in that universe, there there are so many people, there's so many developers out there who will probably jump at the chance to work on a, a core Fallout um, mainline Fallout game. They they've got like entire teams of modders making like game-sized mods like fallout london and they've actually hired people from the fallout london team to work on fallout you know why not just bring on even more of those people invest a bit because the game will sell the game will sell i think it's worth investing in a new team for this there's enough people out there you know enough developers out there who would jump at the chance to do that i think but i don't know i don't know what do i know what do I know? What do you know? Uh, yeah. We have a super chat here from Angel. Dropping the 10. They say, if Xbox wants to target younger audiences, would it make sense for them to build affinity for the brand by building experiences based off their IP within games like Roblox and Fortnite? Now, that is an interesting That's question. That's an interesting Because idea. Phil like, talked about, for, like... For a whole Halo game inside for in Roblox? Yeah, because Phil talked about this idea of uh, Gen Z not buying consoles and they want their games everywhere uh you know some people looked at that as like oh he's just excuse you know he's using gen z as an excuse for why xbox isn't doing so hot or why they're putting their games elsewhere and you know i've all <laughs> you know phil had the interview which we'll talk about about polygon and people dissecting his comments about you know xbox handhelds and stuff of that nature um mm. and i I think I said that maybe Xbox should just be media quiet like PlayStation and Nintendo are and just mm. not offer up all these morsels of information and information because, you know, people will take what Phil says and out of context. Well, not even necessarily out of context, but they'll 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 make it say like, "Hey, uh they'll 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 make it like they'll use what he says to kind of further whatever sort of thing they want to talk about and it's like oh like well taking that out of well whatever <laughs> either way it's almost like you, you should really step out of the limelight and let your games and your platform do the speaking instead of always trying to come out and uh explain things to people because to a lot of people when you're trying to explain certain elements of the game industry while there are those of out there that really appreciate it there are others who just look at it as just like oh you're just you know that's you're just blaming this thing i think one of the one of the issues with the the stuff that phil was talking about is the fact that he can only say so much like he talks about the handheld and he's like, we'd like to do a handheld. But it's it's like, why can't you just tell us if you are doing a handheld? I mean, that's what I want to know. Are you definitely doing a handheld? Or are we just going to relentlessly tease it forever, you know? Like, I think that's that's where it's kind of getting to the point where the teases are, are fine and dandy. But we kind of want... I think Xbox fans deserve something of substance now. After after all the the drama that's been going on since forever. You know, let 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 the I suppose let the games and stuff talk speak for itself. I don't know. But back to Angel's question is like, if you're trying to appeal to a younger audience or Gen Z, what have you, why not build Xbox experiences within Roblox and Fortnite? Because Roblox is definitely where the younger generation kids are playing games, right? My nephews spend so much time in Roblox. I've I never thought I would spend any money in Roblox, and here I am, probably have spent like six hundred dollars on Roblox for my nephew. Right? Oh, you have? Yeah, I mean, I've you know oh for his God. for his birthday for Christmas, you know, like here's oh, right, here's a hundred dollars in in oh, Roblox. <laughs> no, here's a hundred dollars in Roblox currency. What have you? Right? <laughs> um, I I sort of I I now that I'm thinking about it, it's like yeah, could you? We know you could build like a Halo experience in Roblox or you know, a Call of Duty experience or whatever other sort of stuff you could build in there. Uh, you know, it, I guess it would be weird if you did. But, uh, do other companies do that? Not like, uh, maybe... I have no idea. I want to say I there have no been idea. like... I've seen... I want to say maybe I've seen advertisements is, in, in Roblox before, but 
I'm not sure if We're, I've seen other game companies make content within Roblox to advertise their actual true game they want people to play, right? We're out of touch, man. We're out of touch. We don't know what the kids want. But even in Fortnite, what, what, you, what are you really getting? You're just getting skins, I, you know, like... I don't think Epic would allow you. I, although I guess you could be a creator and build your own sort of experience in there with the skins. And, and Microsoft does have what the Master Chief skin in there, and they got some Marcus Phoenix skins from Gears and stuff. Uh, so there's stuff in there. I, but no, it's an interesting, interesting thing. Like, how do you, um, how do you appeal do you to? Gen Z? I don't know. Yeah, because like I, I'm thinking want... about our age gamers, right? Like. When we wanted to play video games, games. they were on console, right? So you you had to get the Nintendo or the Sega Genesis. Everything was always, you had to, okay, you had to get this machine, right? Even with PCs, like you have a a machine that that plays the games, but, you know, Gen Z has grown up with tablets and iPhones and everything at the, you know, touch of their button. They're used to everything, one, being free for the most part. And they're also used to playing wherever they want to play, and that kind of flies in the face of the idea of like getting a singular device to play a singular game here. Uh, but you know, I'm not an executive, and I don't need to think about that stuff. Is there, but, is there any Gen Z in the chat? I'd be interested to know if there's any Gen Z in the chat. So, like, if you're Gen Z, I think you're under the age of 24. Ooh, youngins. 24, 25, youngins. I bet. I bet there's no Gen Z in the chat. Everyone's probably like, like. 26 or over i would imagine yeah our age yeah i i don't know like i've got gen z relatives like little cousins and stuff and like they all play genshin they all play genshin impact or roblox still yeah. hmm. what you do and that's the dilemma that's the dilemma if you're um if you're uh if you're a publicly traded company you have to take a, a future facing view of of your business you know and what do you do how do you appeal to the next generation and what's the next generation going to be interested in you have to try and predict that and try and maneuver towards that and i suppose like oh we do have some gen z in the chat oh man are you guys guys traditional console gamers so that's really interesting shout out to the gen z listeners listening to two old dudes talk gaming um you're older than me yeah uh there's a Nixie says he's 11 years old. 11? And you're listening to yeah. Xbox 2? Oh, my Lord. I, d- I, d- I doubt that somehow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you man, need to, you but... need to, Jess swore earlier. <laughs> yeah. I sure? think there are, like, there's, there's bound to be, like, Gen Z gamers who've sort of been raised by console gamers of our generation, you know. Of course there is. But, um, you know, I th- there's my main tank in World of Warcraft in my guild. He's 19, I think. So he's like he's like a young gun, right? Um, but I think they're they're really concerned that Gen Z won't want to play Xbox games or PlayStation games, you know. Um, but I I don't know how true or not true that is, you know. I have literally no idea. I have no data, and I have no. I'm not in that kind of world. It does it does make me feel out of touch. I don't use TikTok. I don't listen to you know these these Gen Z appealing influencer kind of people. Like what's his name, the guy in the WWE, Logan Paul. You know? Ah, Logan Paul. Logan Paul, like he's a, he's a big Gen Z guy, I think. I'm really fucking out of touch, man. Bro, we have a, we have Shit. we have young kids old. listening to the show, bro. You can't swear We're like old, that, man. <laughs> Dude, we have young listeners. Ten years, ten. Dude, do you know do you know what happened to me recently? What what happened? I noticed I've got nose hair, dude. <laughs> You've always had I got nose hair. Nose, though. yeah, but like. Like, I'm aware of it now. Oh. But my nose was itching, and I was like, dude, what the hell is this? I need, I need like, a, like, I need like a Manscaped nose hair trimmer, which they do actually stock, by the way. Code XB2. But <laughs> I'm getting old, man. And I, jo- jo- Jones, Jones in the chat says, how can you get on a tablet? I tried playing Minecraft with Touch. It is so hard, man. It is so hard to play Minecraft with touch, like to to like knock punch down the trees and stuff, and and build. But like you see these little kids doing it, like whizzing around. I know my, with with the touch. Like my nephew like, like is is crazy good at 
playing on his iPad with Roblox yeah. and the touch stuff. And it's like, okay. I can't, I it's can't a second that. nature to them, essentially. <laughs> oh, you got some shout outs in the chat for the Manscape nose hair trip. <laughs> It's you know it's funny it's oh, funny you say that because the controller when you when you if you're actually someone who doesn't game the controller is a very intimidating device. My my girl my girlfriend really struggles with the controller. Dude, yeah, I, she, I remember I gave she's completed um she's completed New Super Mario Brothers like the the one on Switch not the not the not Mario Wonder the one before that. Um, I bought a Super Mario Wonder for Christmas, but the one before that, she completed that game that Mario. But she, it was really hard for her to do, and bless her, she stuck through it. Oh, bless her struggling heart. With, yeah, struggling with the controller, you know, and the, the concept of, like, running and jumping at the same time. Because she's only started to pick it up in her, in her like, late 20s, you know. And it, <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, trying to teach a caveman to, to drive, drive a yeah. car. It know? all feels second nature to us, like, Think about but it. You have, like nice you have two. You have two joysticks, two thumbsticks, right? Four face buttons, uh, uh, two triggers, two bumpers. I remember I handed the controller to one of my sisters. Never really played a game before, and I and it was Halo first person. They couldn't move and turn at the same time. They just couldn't. Their brains couldn't grasp the idea. So like they'd move forward on the one stick, and then if they needed to turn, they would turn with the other. But they couldn't do them both at the same time. It was just too much for him, right? So, mm. yeah, and it's uh, but you know, watching watching my nephews just zoom through, <laughs> uh, Roblox, you know, with, with touch controls on all these games he plays is like, oh man, I I would probably be I wouldn't know what to do, but they do it. Uh, James with the twenty dollar and the super chat says, "Am I being stupid?" Or did the clocks change in the U.S. but not here? Or is the podcast earlier? Either way, hope you both well. Rand loving Banishers and Jez loving DD2 fills me with joy. Have a good weekend, bros. So Jez said the same thing to me. He's like, the clocks move? Yeah, bro. Like, clocks moved forward like three weeks ago or whatever it was. The beginning of March, I, I believe. I was confused. I couldn't, I couldn't remember if it was our clocks that moved or your clocks that moved. But no. I, our clocks haven't moved yet. Around, we got a little bit of breaking news. Breaking news. Breaking news. A, li- a little bit. A little, a little bit. bit of. Is it breaking news that I'll care about? Sometimes. Well, no, you won't. Oh, jeez. Um, it's uh, Killer Instinct is getting a new update that includes okay. a new stage. Oh, interesting! First, a new stage. New, new stage. So All that's right. like that's like actual new content. That's that new is new stage content. called the the debug void. Ooh. A new unlockable uh, color skins for every character. Permanent ranked crossplay. And some gameplay tuning, and they've got a picture of Spinal on the on the banner. So I hope that doesn't mean the Spinal nerfs, because I can only play Spinal. That's actually a big patch. There's a lot of, lot of tweaks and stuff. Um, uh, there's some Hisako nerfs coming down. Uh, Hisako has been on our radar for a while as <laughs> a potential candidate for strongest character in the game. They've nerfed Hisako really hard, nerfed the damage and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, but yeah, that's the, it's, 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 it's nice to see Killer Instinct get patches again. Now the Iron Galaxy is back on, back on it, man. What do you, what do you think? You, you, you Killer Instinct 2 on the cards? That, that's kind of hype, I think. That is what, and I, I said this last summer, that is one game that has to be multi-platform. I don't think the fighting game community overall is big enough on Xbox to support an exclusive fighting game. So that's that's one game where I think you have to put multi-platform, but yeah, it's nice to see Killer Instinct get some stuff. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. It's cool that Killer Instinct's getting more support. A new stage is really interesting. Uh, I did not expect that. I think it's probably all going to eventually lead to a Killer Instinct two, like a brand new game. Yeah. Right. I said I I said it's probably going to be a new game, and that is one game that has to be multi-platform. I think. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with you. Kill it. The, the the reason for that being the, the fighting game community is not on Xbox, and that's a game that you want to thrive. So it's like, yeah, you put it everywhere. Hopefully it's a big success. Even, but even Street Fighter's sales, like, they, they don't blow up like, uh, like a, you know, so all, the, all the genre games would, you know? Um, the fighting gaming is kind of like a, a very passionate 
um, subculture, you know, right. kind of like uh, like RTS maybe and stuff like that. But yeah, it's cool to see anyway. Yeah, but James, no, the clocks, the the podcast isn't earlier. It's still starting at the same time, at least here in the in the U.S., where the clocks move forward like the first week of March. It says that I guess the clocks in the U.K. and elsewhere in Europe haven't moved. So, yeah, our clocks haven't changed. Yet. When do your clocks and, and move? I, think, I don't know, but it's like it's it's been three it's three weeks. Um, it's longer than usual for some some reason. Maybe because of the leap year or something. I don't know. But yeah, they'll they'll go back to normal soon. But absolutely, Banisher is great game. I recommend that. But I'm sure it'll probably be on sale at some point. Sith Lord, member for 14 months. Happy Friday, Rand. How do you feel about the Sox this season? I don't really feel any particular way about them. Will you try the new Campfire Shake at the game, only available at the 300 level? I probably will not go to a game this year. I haven't been to a a game at the Cell or you know the new Comiskey Park since 2005. With the year they won the uh, World Series. No, I don't. I, I haven't really been to one, so I'm going to say I won't be to one this year. Uh, Tate Master Jujutsu says VGC cooked Phil Spencer, rightfully so. Utter failure. Wow. Face 23 BKA and Y with the 19 says, Won't it be a bad look for Xbox releasing a all digital Series X this year when the PS5 Pro is coming? out especially if there are similar in price range so i I guess there's a good time to talk about the new xbox console leaked jazz this is the new xbox console leak face uh, is alluding to yeah from xputer right xpure and ecstasis on twitter that those pictures Um, need an (laughs) anti-aliasing yes uh, that they were pretty pretty cooked those pictures but um X Dace is a good good guy. I met him at Gamescom last year, and um, uh, he's got a good track record. So I'm inclined to believe this leak, even though the pictures need anti aliasing, <laughs> as you said. Yes. But yeah, I it's uh, man. I the thing about the thing about digital consoles are that they have better margins because you don't have to factor in people playing second hand games on them. So the fact that all the all the all the games sold on that system are going to be digital digital licenses that are locked to the console can't be resold blah 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 so better better margins potentially than a disc based version, um, but I do I do wonder about the optics I really do for the reasons that um, was suggested there and it's the fact that like Sony's going to have a more powerful PlayStation to talk about this year whereas Xbox is going to have an Xbox that has less features. So mm. price will absolutely be key here. Absolutely. Like if the price, yeah, if the price isn't right, it's going to just look bad. And then it's like, well, okay, so Microsoft could sort of offset this by talking about what what comes after that. Maybe they could talk about the Xbox Series X Pro or the handheld. Well, that but just then kills like, any sales momentum of the yeah, exactly. current one. <laughs> It, yeah, exactly. It's like you you don't you don't want to talk about what comes next if you're about to sell a box that you want people to buy because no one will buy it. So unless I, the handheld comes before the new console, right? Because we're of the, the before the Series X. Well, the white Series X. So like the idea the idea of like okay, if you announce what's next, but like say you don't announce a console but you announce like the handheld and you're like we're working on a handheld and it's coming 2025 and they they launched the handheld before they launched like the next generation uh actual console it's like here's a piece of hardware like announcing a handheld isn't really going to take away from any console sales would it Mm -hmm. you know what i mean like i I don't know that but to what face says like so okay so anybody doesn't know Last year we had the leak that Microsoft mistakenly put up on their own, you know, through their own thought of like, hey, here's the heart, here's all of our timetable stuff, right? We have a Project Brooklyn, which is the next box series. I wonder if someone got fired for that. Uh, maybe, but it was essentially a, a white Series X with double the storage. It'd be two terabytes of storage internally. Maybe like some changed Wi-Fi something or whatever the hell. I think it was codenamed Brooklyn. And it was supposed to be launching this holiday. But I guess according to this uh, report, it's going to be launching this 
like June, July or something. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean when you when you look at the face of it, it's not even it's not like a slim. It's not like the PlayStation that had okay, here's the big PS here's the big PS5, but okay, here's the reduced model uh, that Sony can sell for you know that's Sony reduced cost on, but it's a smaller model and it's the slim. This is like looks like it's the exact same size, so no savings in space, uh, just. Removal of the disk drive, um, same internal specs. It doesn't look like, you know, I, I saw Brad Sam's talking about it. It doesn't look like it has anything changed internally just from the pictures. And, yeah, so then, like, you're going to be releasing this in a time where, like, we've seen in Europe, the Xbox sales are down 47%. I don't, you know, how they're we're, we're doing or Xbox is doing in, in the U.S. Uh, you're probably down as well. So how exactly is introducing the same thing, but with no disk drive and a new color variant at the same price going to actually do? Granted, I don't think it'll be the same price as the PS5 Pro. I think no. the PS5 Pro is going to at least be starting at 599 with the chance of it being 699 depending on skew, skew variations or how expensive the system is to make. Um, but at least that system is doing something new, something better, has new hardware, where this is just the same hardware, granted with maybe an extra one terabyte of storage. Um, but I think part of the reasons is that, you know, for the current state of Xbox hardware selling the way it is, is I think they've maxed out at that price point. I think this, I think if you're selling that Series X and you're coming with white, even with double the storage, that thing probably needs to be 399 I agree. Um, um, the, the the thing is, right, um, Another there's another aspect of this that you didn't mention yet, and, and apparently has an improved heat sink. Okay. So one of the things that I've noticed is that um, I don't think the Xbox Series X has a particularly high failure rate. Yeah, I was going to say, does the Xbox Series X have like a, 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 like a horrible like failure rate like the 360 i don't really hear too much about that no 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 i don't think it does but i do think like over time i think they are noticing that the heat sinks are especially in warm climates are probably struggling a bit one of my colleagues recently um replaced the heat sink on his xbox series x and there's actually we're actually writing a guide on it um but he said the thermal pace was pretty much gone non-existent mm. and yeah it lives in a warmer climate so there's that aspect to it as well but um i don't know maybe there's better margins on this box maybe they've used better parts or or more affordable parts maybe they've got like a more affordable assembly line now or maybe it's just easy for them to do to put um to put uh put this together like tom warren's in the chat shout out to tom he says there's some minor changes on the motherboard and the heatsink of the white series x New heat sink model and new Nexus card model with the heat sink size the same but redesigned. So you gotta wonder like um uh what are the margins looking like for Microsoft on a box like this and maybe there's you know there's a bit more to it maybe um than just just uh you know let's do this for the sake of doing it or whatever. But um will anyone buy it? I don't know. I think the price has to be key, and I think I, I can't be more than three ninety nine. But at the same time, I mean, the leaked documents Microsoft from last year had it launching at four ninety nine or whatever it was. So, I mean, it and that's but that was the trash can model, right? Yeah, there was this. I, I saw some people being shocked that it wasn't a cylinder. Like, oh man, I wanted the cylinder. Like, you really thought it was going to be a cylinder model? I don't know. Mm-hmm. I I think price is one of the thing like. Personally, I feel when you when you have the PlayStation and the Xbox selling at the same exact price, I don't think that really is a good comparison to Xbox. I think people value PlayStation way more than they value Xbox, so it's in Xbox's best interest to be cheaper. Uh, but then again, I don't know about their margins, how much it costs to make one of these consoles, so maybe they feel like they have to sell it at four ninety nine to recoup their costs. Maybe they feel like adding, if it's really there, uh, an extra one terabyte of storage from one terabyte to two terabytes enough to justify the same price. I guess we'll have to see. But, you know, 
I've seen some reports about the PS5 Pro from people at GDC that even developers are like, why is this even a thing? I don't know if that's going to be a tough sell to consumers. Uh, I don't know if PlayStation is going to have a tough time selling that to people for whatever price point they're going to determine. Because I have a feeling Sony's not going to sell that for a loss. So I guess it depends on what the build is for that. If that costs less than five ninety nine, then it's probably going to be five ninety nine. If it costs more than five ninety nine, you know, depending on how much more, I guess maybe they go six ninety nine. But yeah. yeah, I don't know. To me, when I look at like this, the the this X white the white Xbox Series X, it's not really well. It's not exciting. Like say what you will about more the Pro, how- the Pro is at least an ex- it's exciting because it's new. Right, and it's exciting because it potentially could run games better, could display games better, all the things that come along with uh, a better piece of hardware. I don't know. To me, there's really nothing exciting about here's a console with the disc drive removed, and it's just a different color. No, oh. I'm sure Microsoft knows that it's not that exciting. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I, I hate I hate white tech, man. I like. There's one reason why I don't like the Asus Rug Alloy. It's because it's white. Like, everything I've got is black. My my, my Razer's black. My phone is black. You know, my Xbox Series X is black. I don't I don't like white consoles, you know? Like, I, I like the fact that you can swap the color plates on the PlayStation. That's cool, too. Hey, Xbox, but... Xbox has the wraps, bro. You don't see people talking about the wraps anymore? The Starfield wraps? The camo wraps, the Arctic camo yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Oh, actually, I've got. A, I forgot about this. I need to review this. I've got a, a genuine wood wrap Ooh. for my Xbox that I need to review. It's like it's like actual wood. I think that's really cool, and that's why I kind of didn't like the cylindrical model because it's like, like, you, it's hard to skin a cylinder compared. You ever? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, and you couldn't lay but, it flat because uh, it'll just roll out of your entertainment center. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I, please, please, Microsoft, if you listen to this, don't make a cylindrical console, please. It's dumb as hell. Um, but anyway, it's not here, not there. Um, Chase from the chat says, when are they going to make a black Asus rug alloy? Well, rumor is that at Computex, they might announce Asus rug alloy too, or some other new Asus rug. So maybe they'll switch the colorway then? I don't know. Um also, D Brand is supposed to be working on a, a black vinyl skin for the Asus Rug Alloy called the Kill Switch, I think they call it. But it's been delayed because skinning that thing is really complicated because it's a really weird shape. Um, but yeah, I don't know. But yeah, I don't think it's that exciting. Um, I don't know, frankly, why they're doing it. Maybe they've got data that's like people, people will jump in for it. I don't know. You think but, this would be bundled with a new controller? Yeah, I I don't know anything about the new controller. I don't know if Tom Warren's in the chat. Maybe Tom's heard something about the controller, but um, but the didn't new you didn't you say something about the new controller system. on your stream? I could have sworn you got in slot. I didn't. I don't think so. Oh. I, I I I probably speculated. I don't know anything about the controller. I might have just re- recapped what's already out there. Like it was supposed to have some button that switches modes or something. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think, but that was in the leak, wasn't it? That it has a, a, a hardware switch to switch between two different devices rather than having to double tap and then mm. you know double tap the signal key or whatever. I'm sure. I'm sure that was in the the original leak. That wasn't my info, but I don't know. Right. Yeah. So who's excited for the uh, white Xbox Series X digital? Adorably, all digital. <laughs> They need to drop never that. Never gonna get away from that. Yeah, adorably. Well, well we weren't supposed to see them we called adorable. It. It but I mean, it was supposed to just be. Yeah, internal, unless right. it was unless it was gonna end up making its way into its marketing material, like get the adorable digital Xbox Series X. It's like mm, any. I don't know. Like I feel like if you're selling a premium model, maybe it should have a disc drive. Granted, I'm someone who doesn't like have a. I haven't used a disc drive in an Xbox console since 2015, but I feel like. For your premium model, your most expensive one, why not put a disk drive in there for people that want it, right? Not everybody's yeah. digital on the Xbox. Because I, I will see people, like, there, there are definitely people who will concern troll the idea of, like, the all-digital future and the digital systems and all that sort of stuff, so. 
And that is a market you are mm-hmm. giving up to potentially PlayStation and and the and Nintendo. You know, that I mean, enjoy physical the, stuff. Yeah, in theory, I mean, you could just have an external disk drive, but like, I also wonder, like, do they not want to do that specifically because they don't want people to be able to plug a disk drive in the systems because they want people to go digital because the margins are better when you can't resell the game you know like you can't resell a steam game um as far as i know i mean god maybe there is some kind of secret mechanism for doing it but i don't think there is um although steam did just announce a very generous um new family sharing stuff Mm. maybe we can get back to that on xbox someday you know Oh, the good old family sharing, yeah. Yeah, instead of having to do what we have to do now, which is that weird, you know, expl- ex- exploit. It's re- you know, the... it's an it's not officially supported. It's just how the licenses and everything works with the game sharing on the system, right? Yeah. But it's, still, it's, yeah. I don't know. Like, I'm partial to game sharing because essentially you can get it with one other person and I don't need to... On PlayStation, you need to log into the other person's account and download what you want. This one, it just shows up in your install list, and you both get a copy of the game, and you both can play at the same time. At least with Steams, it's like only one person can play that one game. So if you own Dragon's Dogma 2 on Steam, and you're playing it, then nobody else in your family can play that game. But if Mm. you do own two copies of Dragon's Dogma, then two people could play it at a time. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it's because my circle's not that large. And I'm perfectly fine with just me and my my game share partner, and you know, having both. You know, one buy buy like the single game, and both of us can play it whenever we want. But yeah, I'm sure there are people. That is a forward looking thing for families and all that stuff. So maybe they they should get on it. But yeah, the game sharing thing is more of an exploit than it is an officially supported feature of uh, Xbox or PlayStation for that matter, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but we have a super chat here from Leo Shizmas. Shizm- I don't know how to say his last name, so I'm going to say Lao. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Jez, do you see Microsoft ever localizing World of Warcraft here in Japan? Been playing mm-hmm. for years in the U.S. realms. I honestly don't know. Is is World of Warcraft not available in Japan? Then I did not know that, because um, it's av- obviously it's available in Korea and and China and stuff. Like it's coming back to China, um, now that they've worked things out with NetEase. <laughs> I'd love I'd love to know the dra- the full drama behind all that stuff. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I'll look into that. I'll try and look into that. That's an interesting question. Uh, we got You'd nerds so. and other legends with the five. With keyboard and mouse on Xbox, does that mean we're getting World of Warcraft on Xbox? Perhaps other PC ports? This is always a, con- a question that comes up all the time. Uh, World of Warcraft on Xbox. I think for a while there, you were of the opinion that it wasn't going to happen, but I believe you changed your mind. That you think yeah, it is, was... is going to happen at some point. Yeah, I think it probably is going to happen now. Um, the reason I was like... I didn't think the reason I didn't think it would happen is because it's it would require I I would have thought it would require a whole new version. However, uh the a lot of people are proving that you can play the game with a controller because there's a mod there is a mod uh called console port uh for World of Warcraft which lets you play with the controller and people use it to play WoW well on a Steam Deck. And obviously it runs really well on a Steam Deck because it's, you know, it's a, it's not the most intensive game in the universe. And uh, there was, I actually saw a post on the World of Warcraft subreddit the other day where he was like, um, oh yeah, by the way, I got, I got to 2000 rating as a healer entirely with a controller, which is like, I, I would have thought that would be, would have been impossible, but they use like the back buttons to key bind all the different uh, party members, which, you know, I wouldn't have thought to do. So it seems like it is something that's probably possible, even with a controller, but um, I suppose we'll see, you know. And th- at the end of the day, you could always just plug a keyboard and mouse in if you were if you were really inclined to do it. So yeah, I do think it'll come. It's a matter of when, not if. 
but it's probably take a while because WoW's got bigger fish to fry at the moment. All like right. fixing the game. Andrew 13 with the 499 says, Did you guys see how PlayStation broke MLB the show for opening day, then turned a quarter of major leaguers into Zippy the Pinhead with a hilarious new bug? I've not oh, seen that. I did, not, I did not see that. No. No. I did not That's see that. Hmm. Uh, we got Jay Slay with the two saying, Jez, you should be playing Unicorn Overlord game of the year. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I should. In fact, I will. I think Unicorn Overlord when I'm finished with Dragon's Dogma, cause I'm playing, I'm playing for Dragon's Dogma two again. I'm trying to do, I'm trying to like do every single quest in the game. Once I'm finished with Dragon's Dogma two, I think I'll move to Unicorn Overlord next. Are you surprised that there's still a lot of discussion regarding the microtransactions in Dragon's Dogma two? Um, the community's moved on from the microtransactions, I think. The Dragon's Dogma community. They're more pissed about things that the game doesn't have over the original. Like, they're, they're missing vocations, spells that got removed, and no true endgame systems, you know. There's a lot of, there's a lot of anger and, and division in the Dragon's Dogma hardcore community. Because Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen has this, like, endless endgame dungeon crawling mode which people really hardcore for years, years and years. And there's no such mode in Dragon's Dogma 2. I'm sure they're going to add one. But people have been complaining about all sorts of things like the end, lack of enemy, poor enemy variety, no no true endgame and all that kind of stuff. So the community's moved on from the microtransaction stuff, which I think the microtransactions in Dragon's Dogma 2 weren't truly a big deal because I, I don't think they affected the game, Dragon's Dogma 2, that much. The issue with the microtransactions here was this is slippery slope mm. you know so if they're selling the return you, of the slope <laughs> the slope there's the, the, the greased the greased slope you know it's it's getting greasier every 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 year the slope's getting a bit greasier and it's like well if they're, if they're selling you a fast travel point today maybe they'll sell you half the fast travel points tomorrow and maybe one day you you'll have to spend a market transaction every time you want to fast travel you know and also it's because the developers said things like in interviews like oh the the reason we have fast travel and the reason you 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 have fast travel in your game is because your game is boring and stuff like that and so it, it just didn't sit well with people that they'd said these things and then sold the solution back to you right but um yeah i i think the community's got over that pretty quick and moved on to just being pissed off at the game in general you know <laughs> But oh well, it is what it is. Everyone's ang- angry at everything these days. I was just, I just, I just enjoy the game, man. I just think it's pretty good. Uh, we but, got yeah. BT Maverick with the ten. Can PlayStation really do anything if the Steam Store, other PC fronts, is allowed on the Xbox console despite their inevitable kicking and screaming? That would be one hell of a chess move by Uncle Phil. All right, so let's yeah. bring, let's, let's let's bring this let's, up, let's right? Move on to this. Let's talk about. Let's move on to this. Phil Spencer wants. Other digital storefronts like Epic Game Store or itch.io on the Xbox. And this is part of like his Polygon interview um, where Phil said, Consider our history as a Windows company. Nobody would blink twice if I said, Hey, when you're using a PC, you get to decide the type of experience you have by picking where to buy games. There's real value in that. Subsidizing hardware becomes more challenging in today's world. And I will say, and this means. This may seem too altruistic. I don't know that it's growing the industry. So I think, what are the barriers? What are the things that create fiction, friction in today's world for creators and players? And how can we be part of opening the, up that model? If I want to play on a gaming PC, then I feel like I'm more of a continuous part of my gaming ecosystem as a whole, as opposed to on console, where my gaming is kind of sharded to use a gaming term, based on these different closed ecosystems that I have to play across. So this idea of, hey, the next Xbox console or Xbox handheld, right? Because I believe the ROG does this, right? Where it's basically a Windows device, so you can install launchers like it's, Steam. It's Windows. And, it's, just Windows. It's, it's just Windows. So in a scenario where, hey, the, the next Xbox handheld, which plays all your Xbox games is also windows you could essentially install steam and epic play all the games that you own on there and then yeah i mean okay like if you obviously playstation games are on steam and then through steam you'd be able to play your playstation games on this xbox handheld or potentially an xbox console um 
I don't know. Do you think this is actually something that is is viable and might happen like soon, or is this more like pie in the sky, wishing from Phil? being like, hey, wouldn't this be interesting? Wouldn't this break down barriers if we could be able to do this? I, I, I don't know. What's your read on this? Because some people talk about it like it's like a done deal. Like the next Xbox console, the next Xbox handheld are going to be like this, where I can go into Steam and play my Steam games on my Xbox device. While other people kind of are like, is this really, is that really something you want? Because that's just giving other, that's just like, that's just giving your customers more opportunity to spend money not in your store, right? If you want to look at like the downsides of it, if you have a device that plays all the games from Xbox and you can play games from Steam and elsewhere, then somebody could decide, well, instead of buying Dragon's Dogma 2 on Xbox and Xbox getting a 30% cut, what if I just bought it on Steam and played it there and I could play it on this handheld and then play it on my PC if I wanted to. You know what I mean? I guess that's one of the... Do- what, do you, what do you think about all this? Phil doesn't, Phil doesn't say things randomly, especially not in interviews like this. You can okay. take this as a tease about what they're thinking about with the future of Xbox, you know. So, yeah, I do think Phil's thinking about this stuff. And one of the other things that um, I think is important to be aware of here is the fact that people say, oh, but what about Xbox? What, isn't, what about Xbox's uh, 30% cut or whatever? The thing is, something I've been, I was told um, l- last year at Summer Game Fest, I was having a discussion about this, and I kind of feel like maybe even back then some, someone was trying to tease me. And they were kind of saying, like, one of the, one of the things like, you need to realize is that it's not, even like when we're running our own platform, it's not free for us to 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 do this this isn't like this isn't a free 30 percent cut we get in here and they, they were like when you factor in overheads like the price of bandwidth the support teams the platform stuff the cut is less like 30 percent and more like 17 percent or, or i think they said 17 percent off the top of my head so like with the way everything's getting more expensive when it comes to servers, chips, and the price of that stuff isn't coming down, it's actually been going up because of the demand for AI, crypto, and God knows what else. You know, NVIDIA's stock price is flying because of the demand for silicon and the, the ongoing sort of shortage. And I do think prices will come down again in the future when, you know, um, you know Intel and other companies are building new chip fabrication uh, platforms all over the world you know there's a but the the us did that chips act thing to build chip factories and the european union's building chip factories i think they just announced uh, intel's announced they're building a billion dollars billion dollar worth chip of chip factories in germany for example like when when like there's more chips being made theoretically prices will come down because you know supply and demand so on and so forth and maybe in that scenario the margins of having your own platform become better again but as of right now the margins of having your own platform aren't necessarily that much better than just letting someone else run the platform for you and that's why like in in that in that universe microsoft probably thinking like well what if we made a system where you could basically get your playstation exclusives which is the steam deck right what if we made a platform where you could do that and also it run the Xbox operating system so we could still sell Xbox games, you know, Xbox versions of games there as well. But I can't help but feel like that is like a huge, that's a risky boy. You know, I think that's a risky boy because in that scenario, it's like, well, if, if, I'm, a, if I'm a developer, I'm like, okay, well, the next Xbox runs Steam. Why would I bother porting the game to Xbox when people on the Xbox can just get the Steam version? Because porting games to Xbox is a pain. You know, having, having to, to redo all your achievements and stuff, which I know developers hate doing. They hate doing achievements. It's overheads for them, and it doesn't help their games at all. It only helps the platform. You know, all that kind of stuff, the platform-specific stuff that you have to abide by. Why would they bother going through that rigmarole if they can just bring it to Steam? Now, in that scenario, again, how does Xbox make a profit on hardware in that scenario? Well, the price would have to go up. And if the price went up to the point where they're making some kind of profit on the box and then PlayStation's offering a box that's cheaper, who's going to win the console war? It's going to be PlayStation, you know? So, and then Microsoft basically prices itself out of the console market, gives the console market to PlayStation, gives the PC market to Steam even more, 
and then they end up squeezing themselves out of their own market. So I think this is kind of like it's there's got to be something here that I'm sort of not seeing potentially. Is this is this, is their play ultimately like Game Pass over everything, which kind of goes against the narrative that they're de-emphasizing Game Pass. Um, you know, I, Chris String at GameIndustry.biz said that he'd heard there was a de-emphasis on Game Pass, and then PC Gamer put out an article the other week where they spoke to a bunch of devs and they're saying the gold rush is over for Game Pass deals and Epic Game Store deals and all these kind of content deals. The gold rush is over, but I was told recently that xbox will spend more on xbox game pass third party deals than they ever have in this fiscal year so that doesn't sound like the emphasis to me the fact that they've put mouse and keyboard on xcloud that's a significant amount of investment of dev work to get that working that does not sound like the emphasis to me you know so and also there's a licensing there's a, there is a licensing consideration here you know like PlayStation is not going to be happy if there is an Xbox that can run PlayStation games, even if it's running via Steam. That that will create a contention. Like Valve will be like, well, we're not letting you choose which versions of Steam you can run your games off of, you know. So that kind of creates a contention. So maybe Steam will just be like, well, we just won't put, we won't let Microsoft put Steam on our box, you know. And then maybe Epic Games does it. And then Epic Games is like, well, you know, we got nothing to lose because no one uses our store anyway. Um, so I do think there's a lot to be considered here, you know. And would Phil didn't mention Steam specifically, did he? I'm pretty I sure don't he said so. he said Epic Games Store, and right? Itch.io. Yeah, he's talking about stores that, you know with publishers that wouldn't have something to say about it. I'm pretty sure Sony would have something to say about it. There was a situation, if you remember, where on the Xbox Series X and S, you could run them in dev mode, mm -hmm. and then people got PlayStation and Nintendo emulators running on those systems. Microsoft is pretty quick to put the kibosh on that and, and be like, okay, well, we're going to get sued here by Nintendo if we, if we, you know, stop, if we don't stop this, you know. So, um, I don't know. I think there, there are a lot of things to be considered. And um, as Ozzyfi in the chat says, they can block the game, Jez. And it is true, right, that, um, for example, on NVIDIA GeForce Now, that runs Steam, and you, connect, you can connect your Steam account. But developers can opt out of including their game on the nvidia geforce now version of steam mm. because they want to they want to get a cut from nvidia for for that service but it's different when you're selling home hardware like if microsoft is going to make an xbox that runs windows that's a pc basically in essence how is that necessarily any different from just having a pre-built pc it's not really that different. The issue that there, there starts to be an issue though when you start talking about the Xbox licensing model. Because right now, if if I'm a developer and I put a game on Xbox, I'm giving Microsoft a license to sell that game on any Xbox operating system device. Not Windows. If Microsoft could sell an Xbox game on Windows, they'd already be doing it. They wouldn't have to be doing ports. There'd be some kind of Xbox emulator which works on Windows right now. That'd be a thing that that's the thing that Microsoft can do. You know, maybe that's could, what Jason could, Ronald's making right now. You know, and the and the hardware no, team the, or whatever. Yeah, but they can't because they don't have the licenses to do that. That competes with the Steam version, and a lot of developers will be like, "Hang on a sec, you can't just make a PC store using our games without our permission." We want to cut that. We want a new license agreement. We've got to. We want to. We want to talk about this. You know, you can't just do that. You can't just make an a win a, a Windows version of the Xbox Store without our input. You know, and that's that's thousands of games. That's thousands of games worth of legacy. Microsoft can't even get developers to agree to Xbox Play Anywhere today. You know, there's only there's only like 50 games that have Xbox Play Anywhere. Something something in that region. So like you're telling me that publishers and developers will just accept a blanket xbox play anywhere licensing deal because that's what you're talking about if you're making a console that is an is an open platform if you're making an xbox store that 
um can run on windows then that's what you're talking about is that forcing xbox play anywhere on dev developers and i can't see that happening i can't see that happening that's a huge that's a huge um you know that'd be a huge coup but maybe it isn't on windows in general maybe it's just locked to that xbox you know maybe it still has to be an xbox branded device or something maybe that means that it wouldn't be full windows but some kind of quasi version of windows which has some gaming stuff on it but doesn't have you know you can't boot into the start menu or open device manager or all that all that other kind of stuff so if there's some kind of a more open version of xbox coming up there's there's a lot of licensing things to be considered and also like how does it negatively impact xbox as a as a brand do developers stop supporting xbox versions of games does that mean like you know they they're giving even more clout to steam and stuff like that would steam even be on there because phil specifically didn't mention steam and maybe he didn't specifically mention steam for that reason you know but i don't know we'll see man i honestly don't know where they're going with all this and i guess we just need to wait and see um, what's your thoughts on it, though, Ryan? I don't know. I honestly don't know what to think about this. Because I, I guess maybe it's because, like, I don't have any Steam games. So I'm trying to think of, like, the benefits. To me, obviously, are, are zero. It's like, oh, that would be cool. You, you could play Steam games on, on your device or Epic games or whatever. But I'm trying to think of the minutia of it all. And... I'm sure it would appeal to there. There'd be people who it would appeal to for sure. Uh, but I don't know. Nothing's like this has been done before in the space. So you're talking about something brand new of like, Hey, here's your Xbox console, but there's a way to boot into windows and then install the Epic game launcher and then play Epic games on it. I, how would that work and all that sort of stuff? I, it's it's an intriguing possibility. I just don't know if that's something that is really going to, you know, make people want to. Is that something that's going to be like, all right, that that's definitely a reason I want to get the next Xbox piece of hardware because I can be able to get Xbox games, I can get PC games on there, I can, you know, play my Xbox games on PC. But then all these PC games, I maybe don't get an. I could play them here underneath uh, my TV. Sometimes I just want to play games on a couch. I suppose, but I think, I don't know if it's limited to, you know, Epic and itch.io, it's kind of like, well, you're missing the big one. You're missing steam. And I, I don't know. I just, I guess maybe I would need to see this like explained, uh, video format whenever, if this ever, you know, eventually comes to fruition, this seems to be more like a, like something like a handheld I mean, would do in a, in a business update and in a, in a potential business update. This seems like something like a handheld would do. Like, let me ask you this question. Let's, let's just say like the Xbox handheld is a windows based device, like the ROG or the Len Lenovo. Right. Mm -hmm. And you can, you're in windows and you can install steam. Would valve have problems against their launcher and the game and the would publishers have a problem with the games potentially running on this Xbox handheld device with all these other Xbox games? Like would Sony have a problem that people could play horizon forbidden West on their Xbox handheld? Is that something like they could be like demand that the system not well, run? Is, well, this is the other, this is the other aspect of it. If it is like, if it is like the ISIS rug ally, the Nova Legion go Microsoft runs head first into the same problems they had with surface where they don't want to piss off their OEM partners who work on Windows devices. So, like, in order to not piss them off, they price, they overprice Surface out of the market. So, like, Surface devices are aggressively overpriced because they, they don't want to undercut their partners. So, like, if Microsoft made a handheld, they'd be in the same situation if it was full-blown Windows. Like, that there has to be some kind of compromise there where it's like, okay, if we want to make a handheld console that runs the Xbox operating system uh, pool of licensed games, then it can't run full Windows because 
then we'll be undercutting our partners while also offering something that they can't offer because they can't offer an Xbox operating system pool of, you know, pool of licenses. It has to be something different. So, like, I personally think, like, it's even less likely that their handheld will run Windows or stores. I I feel like that would be a closed system and they'll leave the full-blown Windows versions of devices to the OEMs, which are going to be more expensive because they're not subsidized by hardware. Asus and Lenovo don't sell games. Or, well, I think Lenovo sells games, but no, nobody's buying games from Lenovo. Literally nobody, you know. So, like, I think um, uh, that's why they're more expensive. They, they profit on the hardware. They profit on the hardware. Whereas Microsoft profits on the software, which is why their devices are cheaper. That's why the Steam Deck is cheaper because they profit on the software. It's like a it's like a gateway to their ecosystem. Whereas Asus and Lenovo are hardware makers, which is why their devices are more expensive because they're not profiting on the software. But for Microsoft to want to do both, that's kind of like that would undermine their partners. So that's why I can't see it happening. I think it's got to be the actual Xbox OS and maybe do a partnership with Epic or Itch for smaller games or GOG or something, but not full-blown Steam because that's when you start undermining everyone, you know? (laughs) That's when Sony starts pulling their games off that version of steam and there's drama and all this kind of stuff i don't know man i really don't i really don't know where it's gonna go i might maybe microsoft just like says screw it we'll we'll screw over our partners and make a better handheld that's also cheaper i don't get it man interesting uh, be very uh kind of want to know more about this and see where you know because like you said phil doesn't necessarily talk about these things that they sort of end up happening and he kind of said that in an interview with you where he's like, my teases always usually end up in something. I'm not teasing something just to tease it. So the fact that he's out there talking about it, GDC maybe gives you an inkling of what they're thinking about internally. So we just would have to see what it is. If, if, if it ever comes to like whenever they announce it, I guess, but anyways, it's so confusing. um, If you guys are joining the show, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe. If you haven't, we got a super chat here from JJ saying 499 gen alpha are the ones that are the ones Phil meant. I have cousins in that generation and they only like to play a mobile switch PC and cloud. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, we have supernova with the five for the health of the Xbox brand to be strong or balanced as well as developers who want bonuses. Game pass day one strategy must be changed. Hmm. The day one strategy has to change, huh? What's that? Day one on PC? I mean, he's just... Supernova just says the Game one game Pass day one strategy must be changed. Oh, you mean um, putting their own games day one? I think this is, this is, the, this is the feeling that um, they're not getting any retail sales mm. and that hurts their games. I kind of like... I can understand that, you know. Um, maybe it does need to change. Um, maybe, they, maybe they should revise revise like which games go in there but they are really committed to it you know they phil was talking about call of duty even coming there as recently as last month yeah again it's like they're committed to this system and they clearly feel like it's going to work out for them long term but we'll see uh sean t with the 199 but the uh, message has been retracted so i don't know what they said Ackerman with the five. Why did Toys for Bob go independent? Also, Jez, Audis Maxwell, B and O portals, or the new Ashray fifties for sound quality, comfort, and overall experiences. So I guess we'll take those separately. I guess which one? Audis Maxwell, the B and O portals, or the new Astros? Which one's Jez? Uh, for sound quality, sound quality, I'm comfort, sh- and overall experience. For sound quality and comfort, probably the Maxwell. Um, they ain't cheap but they probably are the best sounding. Um, Microphones. So I generally don't recommend those. Uh Uh-oh. 
Jazz left I and came to... back. Oh yeah, Discord crashed. Hmm. I say that all these Maxwells are the best, probably for for those things overall. I think um, the mics on the B and Os are ter terrible, um, but they're pretty good lifestyle headset. Like they're good for going out and about, and they've got active noise cancelling. So if you're going to use them for commuting, um, maybe the BNO. And if you don't care about the mics, I haven't tried the new A50s, but they use HDMI pass through, which I think is overly complicated. The new Astro A50s are kind of like designed for people who frequently play on multiple devices. So if you've got an if you've got an Xbox and a PlayStation hooked up to the same TV, and you want a headset that'll do both at the same time. Um, with but well, not simultaneously, but with a with a flick of a switch, rather than having to like disconnect everything and plug it back in, the A50s might be your best bet. Um, but if you're just playing on one system and you just want great audio quality and and comfort, the Ma all these Maxwell is probably your best. Yeah, let's talk about Toys for Bob because you wrote an article. Toys for Bizzle. Toys Indeed. for Bob. So apparently they signed uh, with Microsoft for their next game. Yes. Yes, what I've heard is that they they've completed the negotiations for their next game and um they're on microsoft and they're on board and although it's it's probably to be expected right i mean they they teased it and i don't know why microsoft would say no and the rumor is as well from canadian guy a on on um youtube is that the next game is sparrow 4 i can't confirm or deny that right now but um i kind of feel like maybe they were already working on this and it was it was like a going to be a done deal anyway that they were going to yeah because they wouldn't be know, able to use up. the IP so they wouldn't be able to use the IP without a partnership so it's probably if if it if it is true that it's Spyro it's probably like yeah well of course they've done a deal with them because they're already working on it anyway but I hope it's true because you know the Spyro Bros long suffering much like the Banjo Bros um and uh, you know for people who like those kind of games it's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, he wants to know why they went independent. Yeah, so this is why I've been told about independence for Toys for Bob. And, I mean, this is this is already pretty much out there, but they just wanted to. Uh, the, Toys for Bob is a very old studio. They're, they're 30 years old. They've been going for a really long time. They've been working on all sorts of games over the years. They were responsible for Skylanders, and then they ended up being responsible for Spyro and Crash, even though like they didn't originally necessarily work on those games. Like They did have a lot of people who worked on those games, the original ones as well, within the teams and stuff. So they became responsible for a lot of that stuff. And then during the pandemic and during COVID, Activision kind of like um, turned them into a Call of Duty satellite studio. They're in the Call of Duty coal mines. Um, uh, with with a bunch of other teams like Beanox and stuff who weren't necessarily working on Call of Duty before, um, and with High Moon was it as well? It wasn't working on Call of Duty before, but um, but because they've got such a long history behind them and they've got a tightly knit team, Microsoft kind of offered them the opportunity of you know going independent rather than you know carrying on with what. Activision had kind of priced them up to do, you know, which uh, I think is a good outcome at the end of the day. I think it's like it's like a happy end. It's like a rare happy ending in a modern industry where there's just nonstop drama and nonstop layoffs. It feels like at times. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty much that's pretty much it. The whole the whole shebang is from what I've heard. And I was I was also told that. Toys for Bob was pretty much leading negotiations. Microsoft was, you know, they were keen to find a solution for them. Um, especially with like, first of all, they wanted to go, they wanted to go remote. So Microsoft was like, okay, we'll shut down the, the, the studio offices and we can go fully remote. And they were like, well, maybe we should just go fully independent, you know, because I'm sure Microsoft was like, we need to make some savings here over time. And maybe this is a good outcome for, for everyone involved. And Microsoft has actually done this before. They did it with Twisted Pixel back mm -hmm. in the day. Um, so Microsoft uh, will find these kind of solutions. And you know, while we're on the subject, Sega also just did this with uh, Relic. Yes, they did. So Relic, who worked on Age of Empires 4, I want to say. They didn't work on... They, it wasn't Relic on Halo Wars. It was just Age of no, Empires. No, Creative right? Assembly was on Halo Wars. 
Yeah, yeah. Karate Re- Relic, Relic, Relic did Relics. Age of Empires four, so they're now independent. Uh, yeah. But they, but you know, they still laid off a whole bunch of people at Creative Assembly because they canceled the hyena's game. So they're like that. There's a Gearbox was sold from Embracer to Take Two, who's going to put them yep. as part of the the 2K brand, which makes all the sense Gearbox. in the world because they're the ones who published like uh, Borderlands, and I think yeah. they're even teasing Borderlands Four. Gearbox um, still had layoffs though. As part Gearbox of did have layoffs, and it's kind of funny that Gearbox sold to Embracer for like a billion. And then Embracer sold them to Take Two for four hundred and sixty million. So in stock, yeah, there is some of that, some of that stuff. Uh, Certain Affinity just had layoffs for the first time in like their twenty year history, and they even sort of blamed like third parties' reluctance to kind of do new deals or have work or whatever. I don't know if you saw that. I think there was like twenty five yeah, people got that. laid off at, at there. So, yeah, because uh, Saber's gone from Embracer, and now Gearbox has gone from Embracer. The Relic stuff was a surprise. Uh, you know, I'd rather see you know a, a team go independent than get like shut down. Oh, yeah. You don't nor- you don't normally see you know teams go independent. Like I Interactive went independent from Square, and you know for a while there it was like, oh, who's publishing the Hitman games? First it was Square, then it was Warner Brothers. And then, like, they self-published the third one. And then the third one blew up. And now they're, you know, they're doing a Bond game. We think they're doing a game with Xbox, right, still? Although we don't know for sure. At yeah. least according to the leak last year, they are. And probably another Hitman game. So they seem to be doing great. And I think they're even building new studios. So, um, I don't know. Is it is it one of those things where, like, Microsoft may just go to Relic and just be like, hey, you want to partner up on more Age of Empire stuff? Or like future uh, games? Iron Galaxy, yeah, you know, I would hope so. Um, I know Microsoft was very, you know, happy with the work that Relic had done, but like Relic was also being pulled in different directions by Sega because they they had a lot of Sega-y games that to work on as well. Um, what is a Sega so, game? What what is the uh, Total War? <laughs> I think they worked on. Yeah, the Total War franchise. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so uh, yeah, maybe that could get more focused and maybe do some more Age of Empires stuff. Because Age of Empires is huge for Microsoft. It's like one of the Age of Empires two is one of their biggest games still. And um, uh, I actually heard tentatively recently around that uh, oh, World's Edge just uh, greenlit a new project. Really? Very very recently. Yeah. Really? And yeah, any really. any hints on what this new project mm, is about too, or what? Too, too early. Too, too early. early. So. Now, is it too early to say, or do you know, but it's too early for you to say what it is? I, oh, what it, I know what it is. You know what it is. I, okay. I'm not going. I'm not going to say. I'm but you gonna cannot say. say. No, I'm not going to say. So, World's Edge uh, is working on something new. Is it franchise related? I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm not uh, saying. Don't uh, try and get me to say, Ryan. <laughs> Shut up. Okay. <laughs> we don't do that anymore. <laughs> All right, uh, but I'm excited about it. Put it that way. All right, so Jez is excited about it, so you know no one else will be. Right? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people will be excited about this one. I think. Interesting, interesting. Okay, uh, we have Silas in the super chat with the five. Rand Lisan Al Gib. If you had to either get rid of your digital game library or your physical book collection, what would you do? Oh, Ugh, man, choices. Choices. Mm, choices. Do I get rid of my digital game library or my physical book collection? You see, oh, I've already, easy. I've already gotten rid of my physical book collection once. Books. Do I would what I would I want to get rid of them again? I don't know. The thing is, at least I could get rid of my physical book collection. I could sell them if I wanted to. My digital game collection is kind of unless I sell my account, which is a no no uh, against Microsoft terms of service. Those are stuck. I don't know why you got to propose this question. I'm not sure what I would do. Maybe I would get rid of my, I, you know what? I'd probably get rid of my digital game library, to be honest with you. Damn. If I had to choose one Are or the other. Are you serious? Maybe. I don't know. I I, I don't know. Are you trolling? That answer, you're trolling. That answer could be different tomorrow, so I don't know. You're trolling. You think so? You think I'm trolling? Yeah, I think, I think you're trolling. Um, um, a game that uh, had 
I was kind of surprised. Previews, interviews, Judas from Ken Levine. Yeah. A, a lot of um, no relation to Avril Levine. Yeah. A lot of a lot of journalists went out there to interview him and stuff. And I mean, they all call it Bioshock in space, which is like, sign me the F up. I know there's a lot of current day hate regarding the Bioshock sp- series, especially Bioshock Infinite. Bioshock Infinite. Especially Bio- Bioshock. Especially Bioshock Infinite. Um, mm. I don't care. It's just kind of like the Starfield stuff. Like when I was like, hey, I like Starfield a lot. People are like, no, you don't. That game's mid. The game sucks, you stupid Xbox. It's like, I don't. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to upset you. I, I didn't like Bioshock Infinite before it was cool to not like Bioshock Infinite. And that's fine. You, you have bad taste in games anyways. It's too bright so, and colorful, man. That may be. That may be. I was but, like, what, give me my rapture. I don't, I don't like this cloud bullshit. <laughs> but there, that's, that's my, there are a that's couple of really smart opinion about that game. There are a couple concerning things in here that I'm not like oh. really sure how I'm going to feel about it. But so it's Bioshock in space, which I'm a hundred percent for. It has a non-linear story structure, which is fine with me. The main character has a memory loss. Fine. That's how you want to present it. I get it. Uh, it's kind of been done before in the these games anyways. Memory loss is a typical story telling device. They call them white rooms when you uh you get a book when a character has memory loss, right? I mean, so, that's pretty much the 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 opening of Dragon's Dogma 2 as well actually. I mean, yeah. Uh there's three major side characters, Tom, Hope, and Neferiti, with Tom voiced by Troy Breaker, and each of their n- narratives occur simultaneously. Your decisions with these characters greatly affects the narrative and every player's experience will be different. And there's some roguelike elements. Judas can regenerate herself Ooh. after dying. I guess you also no. lose your equipment and stuff. That's the kind Ew. of thing where I'm a little bit like, Ew. I'm not the uh, biggest fan ugh. of the roguelike I like, stuff. No, I don't like roguelike. But I am willing... Roguelike feels like... i tell you what I don't like about roguelikes. Mm-hmm. It feels like arbitrary difficulty padding okay. it feels like rather than having like difficulty you know come from the mechanics it's like the difficulty is that you you get set backwards i don't like that so much personally i know some yeah. people really like that i don't really like that it. if you die you lose all of your items and can earn resources for upgrades both the narrative and combat encounters will change based on what faction you side with and they talk about narrative Legos. So the 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 roguelike stuff kind of just I look at that, I'm like, uh But then all the other stuff here, I'm like, okay, yeah, that sounds great. Bioshock and space, nonlinear stories, three mm. major side characters, when you side with one and blah 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 with the others, but oh you die, you lose everything. It's like, ugh, I don't know. Mm. We'll see. We'll see. Still but there's I, a new Bioshock coming games. as well, right? Yeah, they were supposed to have been a new Bioshock coming for years now. I mean, who knows? Ugh. Who knows? But another game was officially revealed uh, this week. Marvel Rivals, Jez. Ooh. So Marvel Rivals is a free-to-play 6v6 shooter with destructible environments. There's 18 confirmed Marvel heroes like Black Panther, Doctor Strange, Iron Man, Loki, Magneto, Spider-Man, and a whole bunch more. They say they have a robust post-launch roadmap. It's in development for PC with the closed alpha in May with 12 heroes. So we talked a little bit of this about on a kind of funny X-Cast. And, I mean, it really looks like they copied... It really looks like a th- it's a third-person Overwatch, and they copied that game. So how do you feel about it? Being the You're probably playing Overwatch right now, right? I'm actually playing Overwatch you're, right now. Of course the you are. New- the new hero venture is absolutely sick. Probably going to get nerfed to hell, but oh well, it is what it is. Um, yeah, I don't care about this for a number of reasons. A, Overwatch already exists, so mm-hmm. don't need a new Overwatch. B, it's Marvel. Don't care about Marvel. Never have cared about Marvel. Even when I was a little kid, didn't care about Marvel. So this is just this is just like not not for me. Multiplied. So I'm personally not interested at all. The only good thing about it is maybe it brings some competition to more competition to Overwatch and kicks up the ass a little bit. Maybe get a bit more investment or focus or whatever. Apparently they've cancelled the the story PV mode stuff in Overwatch, which on the one hand 
kind of sad about. But on the other hand, I never played any of the PvE stuff because I play Overwatch for multiplayer, so it's my own fault. <laughs> you know, I didn't play. I didn't play it, but it also just wasn't that interesting or that good. But I think Overwatch lost a lot of its goodwill when they were like, "Oh yeah, we're doing a sequel because we're doing a PvE story mode." And then they were like, well, actually, okay, we, we're not doing the same. The story mode scope has been reduced a lot and cancelled a little bit. We're just going to do missions now. But even the missions have been cancelled and removed from the game. So they're just, going, they're just going full bore into the multiplayer now. And I think maybe it will benefit from having a better focus and stuff, I guess. But, yeah, I don't know. I'm not interested in Marvel Rivals at all, personally. But you I'm surprised me. I'm shocked. Because you, yeah, you surprised me though, because you, well, you did make it sound like you're a little bit interested in it. Um, I'm a little bit interested in it, right? You know, I, I do like the Marvel stuff, and it seems, I, I, here's the thing, I could try it out and play like 15 matches and be completely done with it, and right? Mm-hmm. It does very much seem like they just copied Overwatch with third person, but a game like this makes sense. When you think about like the type of games Marvel has or, or or the areas they're in, right? You have single player games and stuff. You have like a card game. Uh, why not have a, a, a you know a free to play six v six game? It makes perfect sense. The problem is, dude, the whole that whole genre is so saturated. Like, is this game gonna be good enough to pull anybody away from Overwatch or from? Fortnite or from Call of Duty or from any of the places that you would need to get players from and then actually retain them to be success- a-, a successful game. It's like the IP is going to get you in the door, right? Cuz there's a lot of fans of Iron Man and Marvel characters, Doctor Strange. But is it going to get you to stay or are you just going to go back to your other games? Is this going to be a thing where a year from now or a year after this game launches, we're talking about on this podcast of, hey, Marvel Rivals closed down, right? Shocker. Because we've seen this. We've seen live service games shut down from Knockout City to um, Rumbleverse to a whole host of others because there just isn't that many players and the bigger games hoard all of them, right? Or are we going to be talking about this game in five years where we're like, Jez, you know what? Marvel Rivals is, is, is still going strong. Still one of the most played games out there on PC and Xbox and PlayStation. Man, they did it right. Oh. And then it becomes a case study of like, why this game, why did this succeed and not the others? And obviously people would point to the IP, but we've seen games with the Marvel IP fail. Marvel Avengers from Crystal Dynamics, a huge disaster. Midnight Suns as well. Midnight I mean, Suns didn't do good. Yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy it, didn't. That led to you know Square Enix Midnight selling Suns those studios. Was, um, so yeah, and Midnight Suns was like a critically acclaimed game, um, but they pretty much killed the whole XCOM genre. <laughs> I think. Um, I I don't know. Uh, like Lord Cognito always told me to play Midnight Suns, and I'm just like, oh, XCOM died from for this. So I refuse to play it. I actually think it's sacrilegious on the on the sacrilegious the, the, sacrilegious on the shrine of XCOM that this game exists. But you know, I I'm sick of superheroes, and I don't even I didn't even like superheroes in the first place. Um, but the, there is one there is one reason to be optimistic about this, and that that is, I suppose, NetEase is making it. NetEase knows service games, you know, mm. and they also know competitive service games. They're very good at a, a building and building out these games and supporting them well and you know Naraka Blade Point or Nakara Blade Point I can never remember what it's called but that's got its fans and they've supported that game really well post launch and all that kind of stuff so you know maybe it will be a high quality game um, and you know maybe it will give Overwatch a run for its money but Overwatch has been making moves recently. They've just announced that all the future heroes are going to be free. They won't be part of the premium battle pass anymore. Or you won't have to grind the battle pass. They'll just be free, which is a good move, I think. And also, like, a bunch of other changes they've been making. Like, uh, they've given DPS classes regenerating health, which I think is, I don't know, probably a good thing overall. Keeps the games flowing a little bit more. Less time spent being dead. 
I still think there's work to be done there. And I still think going from 6v6 to 5v5 was a big mistake. Um, but overall, um, Overwatch seems to be doing well. It's the player base on Steam is going up, I think. I'm sure I read that at some point. Um, even though it's still one of, one of the most negatively rated games because everyone hates Blizzard. Right. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, we'll see. I, I'm, I'm, I don't care for it myself personally but who knows who knows what happened i i you know it's funny you mentioned um you mentioned saturation you and you were saying like this market's really saturated and i was sitting here thinking what market isn't saturated what genre of game isn't saturated what genre of game do we need more of right now well no because i feel, I feel like there's just there's too much of everything no you see like when you look at like single player games like a Dragon's Dogma, Dra- Dragon's Dogma, like a Dragon's Dogma <laughs> two, or uh, like a Jedi Survivor or Resident Evil or a Hellblade, those are th- like they're not designed to be played continuously twenty four seven three sixty five twelve months a year, right? They they yeah. have their audience. You sell it to them. Hopefully, you make your money. People play them for 50 to 100 hours, maybe 200 for the super hardcore, but then you're out, right? They have they have a shelf limit. But the Fortnites and the Call of Duties, they don't. They never expire. They always have new stuff happening, new seasons, new content, new skins, changing the maps, all that sort of... They always they keep people coming back, spending money. They keep them all engaged, Right. So, like, that's why you could see multiple single-player games released. Maybe not necessarily side-by-side, because I, I do think it was a bad move to release Rise of the Ronin on the same day as Dragon's Dogma 2. Because I do think, it's like, well, you got two games here. Which one are you playing? Which one are you going to spend your 70 bucks on, right? But given enough space between, all these sort of games can continue to thrive and, and do great. But when you release a multiplayer-focused game, now you're competing with all these other games that are still constantly being played all the time, uh, even though they've been released years and years ago, right? And unlike a single-player game, which can get all of its users in in the first month or two, and you make your money, and then everybody bounces, but you're still golden because you've made your money, with this stuff, it's all about, like, we need to keep these users engaged for years, and it's great if we can get them in here for the first month, but if they all bounce, our game's dead because we're not going to have anybody playing it. It's free to play, right? So you don't have that initial $70 purchase that funds it all. It's like, all right, we're going to get a huge influx of users. And as we know, it's usually like a small percentage of people that actually spend money in a free to play environment. So you have all these people playing, but none of them are spending money. And if everybody leaves and now, well, there's nobody spending any money, you're not going to have the money for the updates and how you're going to get people back. Uh, mm. So I think like the single player market or at least that market, it's, it's, it's different than the multiplayer one because there's different, there are different needs. There's different uh, monetization models and the different things they're going for. So like the success of Dragon's Dogma 2 right now isn't going to impact the success of Hellblade 2 two months from now but you know i reckon it probably did impact the success of uh horizon on steam that's simply because it was released the same day if they would have why does why sony do this Uh, why do they keep throwing horizon under the bus i don't know like this (laughs) i don't know who knows but either way um we have i've downloaded that by the way i'm gonna give it a give it a go i want to finish the original though i'm gonna i'm gonna i might what i do bleh, 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 bleh. what i might do is because i'm i'm gonna try streaming a bit more again i might get the xbox 2 community on patreon to to vote on what game i play on stream that'd be good because there's a bunch of games i want to play i want to play the original horizon which i do have on steam i have the original and my pc is yeah. i haven't beat it though my, my PC is good enough to stream. And oh, your play 4080 is good enough. Yeah, my 4080. Well, I mean, I, it, it wasn't good enough before. My previous laptop was not powerful enough, but this one is. So, play some PC games, bro. Oh, we got Chris R the in the super chat with the five. In your opinion, will Xbox enthusiasm be in a better place after the showcase? I wonder if we are just suffering from springtime slow gaming news. 
Well, I guess they're kind I of... I think so. I mean, I keep I keep trying to remember, like, have there been other times when everyone was down on Xbox and it, it was cyclical? I will say, it feels different this time. It feels kind of different. Do you agree with me on that? Yes, it does. And yes, so... It, it, like the last time people were really down about Xbox was, well, I mean, the most recent time, I guess you could say, is probably the release of Redfall, right? Yeah. Redfall came out, was a turd. Phil gave that interview with Kind of Funny, which was very, like, transparent, and Negative. you could tell he was, you know, very upset. I mean, even before that, you had the delays of Redfall and... um starfield in 2022 to 2023 people were really upset with that but those people, are all kind of like minor right now i feel like people don't feel like there's a way forward for the the console platform i feel like pe- i i do feel like there's this where do we go from here and xbox isn't giving us any answers right now i expect i expect to the community fair fair or not you know fair or not i feel like that's where a lot of the the headspace is right now and and microsoft isn't giving any anyone any answers and maybe it's just a case of like we well, need to wait for new hardware news we need to we need new games to be announced and stuff like that um i do think you know, okay because there's a lot of ways you can take this and i think we can tackle the uh uh you know the the death of xbox thing so it's like xbox enthusiasm will be in a better place after the showcase i think so because so i think people want to see New games, they want to see what their games look like. They want to get release dates and stuff. Now, obviously, you know, Xbox releasing their games on another platform, that cloud is never going to go away, right? Like, you, Xbox could show, here's uh, let's here's a first look at gameplay of Perfect Dark. People are just going to say, I'll wait to play it on my PS5. Fair enough, because Xbox opened that Pandora's box, and it's never going away anytime soon. But you could be excited about all the things that you see there, and that excitement could be, uh, you know, tangible. Now, some of the other, because all this sort of stuff is also kind of, people get, um, they, they see other articles, they see headlines from other places, like the article from VGC about Phil Spencer essentially being the savior, but essentially killing it. I've seen, uh, you know, uh, other people who work for VGC being like, trying to promote this by saying like Xbox has no games. So we're still in the whole Xbox has no games, uh, uh, you know, pocket essentially. Uh, Mm -hmm. But then when you, when you hear things like this, that some publishers are reportedly questioning support for Xbox amid flatlining sales. I mean, of course this is going to drown. It's it's not going to get anybody excited, right? When you constantly are reading all this stuff from reputable journalists like Christopher Dring, who does GameIndustry.biz, you know, he said while he was at GDC, a lot of the talk there is essentially uh, that Xbox's performance in Europe is just flatlining and that one major company who released a big game last year said, I don't know why we even bothered supporting it. And, you know... As a consumer, as someone who games primarily on Xbox, when you see this sort of stuff, yeah, it does dampen the enthusiasm that you have to just, you know, about Xbox or their lineup and what they're doing when you constantly are seeing, hey, there's this indie game that was coming to Xbox, now it's not coming to Xbox. And it's like, they're okay, it's skipping. That Erebon Shadow game that they had at the showcase in 2021... That was coming to Game Pass Day One and Xbox. Well, now it's not coming to Game Pass at all, and not coming to Xbox. It's just going to be released on PC, and they said they're going to be working on getting it uh, to Xbox at some point. I guess because they left their publisher Raw Fury, so now the game is whatever. You see that sort of stuff. You see some of the other these, these comments. It doesn't make you. It doesn't make you, uh, you know, happy. It doesn't make you, it makes you question, uh, it makes you concerned about the future of the hardware. And that goes into the excitement. You know, there are already people n- not happy with the direction Xbox is moving with putting their games on other platforms. 
they're questioning hardware. They look at the har- the hardware, f- you know, sales, and they're they're down forty seven percent in Europe and whatever they're down in the U S. And they're like, man, what's going on? Can can Xbox turn this around? Then you hear, oh, hey, this developer and this publisher, they don't even want to support it anymore. They're thinking of like, why are we supporting it? So it's like, yeah, all these things they add up into this whole thing where, yeah, why, why should anybody be excited when you read into this stuff? Mm-hmm. Right. I don't know. What do you, what do you, what do you think about all these, this stuff? About, about, I think the media, the media loves kicking Xbox when it's down. And this is, this has been true since I've been doing this, you know, mm-hmm. so it's been like, even if it's not true, you know, but the problem is Xbox is giving them a lot of ammunition right now. You know, oftentimes there's there's been like there's been times where the media has been trolling Xbox and it hasn't been true, but like right now there's there's so there's an overwhelming abundance of negative things you can point to about the state of the Xbox platform. You know, and I think the the messaging and communication has been pretty awful. I I really I don't like a lot of what Phil said in the Polygon stuff, and Phil's Phil's being brutally honest, but I don't think people want to hear a lot of that stuff right now i think xbox customers we invest a lot of money in this platform to to feel like we're first class citizens in the xbox ecosystem and the the emphasis is constantly on everything except the xbox ecosystem the the the, the emphasis is always just like oh we're doing ground pc we do you know we got cloud we got we got all this it's like what why does no one ever talk about console anymore you know or if or if they do talk about console it's always in a negative connotation like gen z doesn't want console nobody wants console console's flat blah 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 blah, blah. no one ever talks about like you know um what's good about console right now and maybe maybe it's just because there isn't anything maybe it's because that's the the reality of the matter but also at the same time i think xbox and and this is this is a problem of all publicly traded companies they are too obsessed with growth you know and they have to be obsessed with growth because costs always go up and i'm not naive i'm not sitting there suggesting like they should stop thinking about growth because costs always go up and microsoft has thousands of employees and you know tons of stakeholders that they have a responsible responsibility to you know people's livelihoods depend on the success of this platform and ultimately the platform isn't just about the box it's about making money but the problem is it's like it's that lack of focus which is driving a lot of the the communication issues like the fact that people can point to all this stuff is because of this sort of overarching lack of focus and this has been an issue i since probably the before last summer i actually wrote an article last summer that was like with xbox distracted on abk the console experience is suffering and that's that's been true now for almost a whole year abk is behind us now but now we've got to focus on something else and it's like oh the gen z like how does xbox find growth blah 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 blah, blah and all this kind of stuff as a customer i don't give a shit about any of this stuff finding growth that's a Microsoft problem, mm. you know, Microsoft, yeah, find, find your growth, you know, to, I, I don't know why I have to hear about that. Keep that shit to yourself, you know, I want to know what, what you're doing for me. What is the, what is the, the story for me? And as a customer, what is that, wh- where, where, where's the interest lying there? But we are going to get that information. It's going to come at the summer game fest and stuff like that. But I don't want to wait till then. I want to know fucking now. I want to know now because you've put so much negativity into the the ether and given given us nothing in return. There has to be some kind of trade-off here. We haven't seen any trade-offs yet or even heard about them. All we've heard about is Gen Z this and Gen Alpha bad and console gaming dying and not growing. It's not growing so when you do this or whatever. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, I don't give a fuck about any of that stuff as a customer. I I care about it as an analyst or a writer, but I don't give a fuck about it as a customer. If you're gonna if you're gonna put something negative out there, there has to be like some positive trade-offs, and you know I don't I shouldn't have to read between the lines or find tea leaves and you know whip out some fucking magical lexicon of you know and cast to do some kind of magical ritual to find out what the hell's going on with my console investment right now, you know, and it's not just investment in the in monetarily, it's investment like in the hobby in general, you know, um, Microsoft's not doing a great job of really giving us a trade-off here and that's why it feels different this time 
and the wor the worry is that there is no trade off. The worry is that they're not saying anything positive because there's nothing positive to say. But the thing is, I know that they're cooking. I know they are. I know they are. I just don't know why they're just you know being so slow about bringing some of that information to fruition. I think I feel like we deserve better. We deserve better, and we deserve faster information than what they're giving us. But that's just me. Mm. You know, I was thinking about this the other day about the journey that <laughs> this generation has taken us on, right? You 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 know, like people were on Xbox for their lack of first party games, you know, most of last generation and you know, they responded by buying a bunch of studios in 2018 and 2019 and then buying Bethesda in 2020 and people felt like we were on the cusp of like, all right, finally the promises that you made and the investments that you made, we're start we're going to be starting seeing. Well, obviously COVID happened and whatnot, but there was a point in time in 2021 when you know Microsoft won Publisher of the Year that year, right? They they had a great great lineup of games from Microsoft Flight Sim to Psychonauts 2 to Forza Horizon 5 to launch of Halo Infinite. If you remember, like yeah. we were in that pocket fall 2021. And everyone was like, this is going to be the new Xbox. Great releases throughout the whole year. And we're just going to continue and everything's going to be great. Right? And then January happened with the announcement of ABK. And suddenly now all the talk was about ABK. What's going to be exclusive? Will Call of Duty be exclusive? Oh my God, right? We learned that Call of Duty wasn't going to be. But there was legitimate arguments made by people that this acquisition was going to completely destroy Sony, that Sony was about to be driven out of the console market that they're the market leaders in, that Microsoft was about to create a monopoly, and that Sony and Nintendo were going to feel this monopoly, right? There was a lot of, uh, you know, fear from PlayStation fans that Sony was going to get run out of the market, that they were just basically going to get run ramshot over, and Xbox fans were cheering it because it's like, all right, this is another example like of Microsoft's investment of like, here's these studios in 2018 and 2019. Now we level up to Bethesda. Now we're leveling up to Activision Blizzard, right? Game Pass is going to be booming with Call of Duty and all the Bethesda games on there, right? But then mm -hmm. as 2022 went on, you got the delays of Redfall and Starfield. People were really upset. And the only games that came out that year were Pentiment and Grounded in Early Access. And I think 2022 was like the beginning of, I think people were willing to give Xbox a second chance after everything that happened with the Xbox one. I think people were going, were willing to give it a second chance. And when that happened, if you look at like the console sales between 2021, the launch and 2022, everything was in line with PlayStation until essentially the end of the year when they had nothing. And mm -hmm. I feel like once they delayed Redfall and Starfield, I think the people that were willing to give Xbox a second chance were like, nah, it's the same old Xbox. They can't do anything in the right. They can't release anything on time, right? And you mm -hmm. get to 2023, and it starts off good with the developer direct and a hi-fi rush, which was highly acclaimed. But then you shit the bed with Redfall, and that's a disaster. And that's a game that you had been hyping up for two years at that point. Uh, you get to Starfield, and while I love Starfield, and there are plenty of people that do love Starfield, it didn't do, at least critically, what previous Bethesda big RPGs did. Now, it may have done well enough for Xbox. They talked about it, how it drove Game Pass subscriptions and all that sort of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know if it hit in that like area they wanted it to be, where it was like the next cultural touch touchstone, like the next Skyrim where it's played for years and years and years and has all these users. And then, you know, you, you, you release the Forza Motorsport, which nobody really even talks about anymore, kind of just came and went. Uh, you start 2024 off, and all you have are the rumors of you releasing games elsewhere, and then you confirm those rumors. People think, like, the hardware platform is going to be dying. Uh, you know, you're not releasing another game until, like, Hellblade 2. And what I when I when I lay it out like the timeline like that, it's almost like you, we went from Xbox in 2021 to being like this is the new like they're on they're on the cusp of doing all this, and they really haven't 
still in 2024, you haven't reached that consistent release quality and cadence yet. We're still working on that. But then also, we went from the ABK deal of Sony was about to get run out of the business and Microsoft was about to have a monopoly on everything to people questioning Microsoft's commitment to Xbox hardware, thinking they're yeah. about to leave it because nobody's buying it, and that now you have publishers questioning about whether or not they should even support Xbox. And just the span of less than two years, and went from a, mon- a monopoly to essentially Xbox is dead. Right? Like, you, am I wrong? Is, is my analysis of that situation off base in any way? Because I no, remember I what it was like. People was like, Mike, they were worried. PlayStation was so worried that they, like, their fans were like, oh, it's over. Like Xbox. And now it's like they're celebrating because they get all, they're getting Xbox games. And it looks like publishers don't even want to put their games on Xbox and everybody's skipping on it. Where did it all take that U-turn, Jez? What happened? I don't know, man. It's just... I don't know. It's just... It's just... It's... It's kind of, it's all gradual, you know. It's like what what people want gradual, a sort of consistent quality, but we've been gra- getting consistent knocks instead, you know. Um, and maybe it's not fair. Maybe some of it isn't fair. Maybe people aren't giving Xbox enough credit for the good things they've done, you know, backwards compatibility, Xbox Game Pass being like, you know, consistently great value kind of started taking that for granted a little bit you know they did have pal world in january just mm-hmm. just by now and they announced that um i believe they announced this um that that xbox had its highest usage ever in january partially thanks to the virality of pal world you know and but that should have been like every month you know <laughs> <laughs> and i i'm not saying you can theoretically have a pal world every month but that's one one thing once isn't enough you know you, you've you got to have that consistency and this sort of this sort of like this north star they've had since forever of having one big game release every quarter um just has never materialized and maybe covid's partially to blame for that maybe inflation's partially to blame for that you gotta remember one thing about inflation like america's inflation you know everyone complains about america's inflation being like what is it i think it's two three percent or something it's like it's like it's way higher in a lot of other places like way higher and especially in the uk where a, a lot of microsoft studios live so the, a lot of those costs have gone up which undoubtedly impacts hiring and has all sorts of knock-on effects and you know so there is some something to be said about um you know the fact microsoft has a challenger status and i think the challenger status uh, position they have to work harder you know the when you're in when you're in that position microsoft does have to work harder but at the same time they've spent so much money they have spent so much money and we've just been constantly sort of um reasons to be disappointed is is the is the, the narrative here you know from halo infinite's life service you know, to Starfield not having maybe the long tail that Fallout or Skyrim did, and your games like Redfall, and then the inconsistent messaging, going multi-platform when other companies aren't doing it because they don't need to. It kind of makes Xbox look weak, you know. And um, and I will say as well, recently Microsoft had an all hands meeting um, or like a live stream internally where. They, um, you know, they they talk about they talk about the you know the situation and the brand, sort of like an internal business update, right? They did one of these recently, and one of the speakers was Matt Booty. Um, during this panel, um, you know, which I confirmed with multiple people, um, uh, you know, because Microsoft they, they blasted out broadly. They had they had to have known this was going to leak, um. You know, so because it, it did go out to a lot of people. Microsoft has hundreds, thousands of employees now, so it's it's not easy to keep a lid on this kind of stuff. And and that's why I, I suppose they do sound a little bit corporate, even internally, because they do have, they do sort of make them with the view that they probably are going to leak because there's so many people, you know, paying attention to it. But um, 
uh, I, one thing that I thought was interesting was Matt Booty apparently at this meeting um, acknowledged that the multi-platform strategy had stressed the brand. You know, and I thought that was interesting. You know, the the fact that this was acknowledged in a fairly you know a not public way, but um, that it that acknowledged the fact that it had stress the brand he he specifically also said apparently um we don't think it's damaged the brand but it has stressed the brand or something along that line you know and i'm paraphrasing because i haven't heard i haven't heard it myself i'm just sort of getting it secondhand but um it's something they're monitoring you know and i think like a lot a lot of people are talking about the, the four games that they've announced for this they're all pretty different games in a way they all sit between, they're all different budgets. They're all different sort of types of game. And they've all got sort of different um, uh, intents behind them. And I just saw that True Trophies put out an article because the True Trophies track trophy data on PlayStation. And they can use the, the activity for PlayStation trophies to get some you know, indication of how well a game has done or how a game has done poorly. And like I think we said on the show, Pentiment ain't gonna move the needle for anyone. Lo and behold, according to True Trophies, nobody bought Pentiment on PlayStation. It didn't even debut in the top two hundred games or something like that. Mm -hmm. And Hi Fi Rush didn't do much better either. I think it was it was the top It was like hundred and forty. But even yeah, still like why would you release it during the week where there's two other releases, one exclusive with Rise of the Ronin and the other like the big release, Dragon's Dogma Two. Exactly. And bad, no more bad planning on that. If you want if you wanted it to be successful i guess yeah but that, that's exactly it do they actually want it to be successful or is this just part of a a data collecting exercise and one of the data points that they have to be looking at which is like part part of what matt booty was talking about is how much it's going to damage perception of the brand and i do like this whole discussion we're having right now really started when i was saying like it feels xbox community has had low morale before but right now it feels different mm -hmm. it, the, the the low morale feels different you know how do you measure that on a spreadsheet how does microsoft track that on a spreadsheet you know and one of the one of the things that's important to remember and again i'm just taking this on on faith because i don't really know i don't have the data in front of me but there's different types of communities on Xbox. You know, there's the people who just play Call of Duty, Fortnite, FIFA, Madden, and all that stuff. We talked about that before, the casual audience. And there's the core audience, the people who really invested in the hobby. Maybe they spend a lot of money and maybe they also evangelize your brand. They listen to podcasts like this. Maybe they make their own podcasts, you know, like, like we did, you know, we're, we're in that hardcore audience. Right. And I suspect that in a lot of ways we're driving, we're driving the brand with our investment in it whether it's monetarily or you know just being part of the hobby i built a whole career off liking xbox you know and being invested in the brand and the hobby so um there has to be some kind of analysis with with the four games that they're they're you know they're they're sort of putting together and that's like is this even worth doing you know is this actually worth doing uh are they going to have data here where it's like, well, look, these games didn't sell anything and look how much damage it's done to the brand, you know? And maybe that's the kind of data that Satya and Amy Hood need to see. And they'll just be like, okay, you're right. We shouldn't have, we shouldn't do this. Um, and maybe, maybe it's, it's not worth it. Or maybe we just do it for the service games and we've got hard evidence that um, doing it for single player games is too much of a, you know a damn a, a self-destructive exercise you know because right now like even the geeky nerd says in the chat what's the next four games and the pandora's box is open every time they announce a game people are just going to say well i'll wait for the playstation version there's no there's no evidence that there's no evidence to suggest that that won't eventually be the case that all the games come to playstation there's no there's no real evidence right now i mean i can sit here and say that i've been told that starfield is not in development for PlayStation right now, but even I don't know what's going to happen in a year or two, you know? And if you are, if you are someone who's like considering what console to invest in, why would you invest in Xbox when even the mere possibility of those games going to PlayStation exists when the, the opposite isn't true? There is absolutely no possibility that you're going to see God of War on Xbox. Everybody knows that. 
Everybody knows that, you know. And Microsoft might believe that it will happen someday, but willing it to happen isn't isn't you know going to pan out for them. I don't think. But yeah, it feels different at the moment. I might write about that. Mm. But yeah, but I I, I do want to end this by saying I do think Xbox will be fine because I do know that they have hardware plans for for um you know a well, long yeah. time coming. Well, we need to and talk, I know... talk about the uh the the. Dude, Phil Spencer really wants this handheld jazz, right? Like, yeah. So, and we know they've got plans for good games, and there are loads of games coming. And even though some games have skipped the platform, it's it's not many games, you know. And it doesn't. It should be. We, it should be zero games. It should be zero, but it's like unless it's there's a, unless it's like a technical limitation, su- like Switch, where games skip the Switch because it just can't run on it. Like, it doesn't matter that it's. Because you never hear anything like, oh, we're skipping PC or PlayStation. It just doesn't happen, right? But mm. Xbox is kind of like, oh, yeah, we, we we can afford not to put our game on Xbox. That's not going to affect our business. That's not something you want to hear. Granted, like, none of the games that are skipping are games that, like, I particularly would care for. But I still think that is a concerning thing. Like, you should... you. They've done all this work to try to, like, fix their relationships with the Japanese... Uh, publishers, right? Square is always scattershot with their support, but it seems like that's going to be more uh, like straightforward, right? And all the sort of other things like Yakuza and Persona and these big franchises, but it still happens in some of the indie things and the indie devs are just going to be like, we're just going to do what's best for our business. And sometimes like, hey, focusing on PC and PS5 is the, the way to go. And then you're just like, man, like, is that really the case? Like, you're not even... Re- you're, That's is it not even worth po- it's not even worth porting to Xbox or building it for Xbox at the same time you, like are you is it that it's like as an Xbox fan that is concerning to me because I don't that's one of the things about like this whole strategy of the multi-platform thing that I had a fear of it was like okay well if you put all your games elsewhere that people have less reasons to buy your hardware and invest then third parties and indies are going to look at that and be like well if we're looking at the the console user base, because we're just going to put our stuff on Steam, so your stuff doesn't matter. So if we're just looking strictly at the console user base, you don't really have enough people there for us to support us, so we're not going to. Like that was always my fear, right? So when I I see this stuff from Christopher Dring, who I don't think is lying, but I don't know about the agenda of the person I'm telling him that stuff, right? Because you're not sure. It's just kind of like. Yeah, I mean, hopefully that's you know Phil and all them are at GDC trying to like talk to the people about this because yeah you can say oh monster hunter story is not coming to xbox not a big thing it's it's a I game par- no it, it is a big thing it is a big for thing, you actually. because you care about it right um but it, it doesn't matter until it's a game that you care exactly about, you know right so this is something that needs to be fixed and i don't know how you fix it the only way to fix it is like build a platform game that has bag, man. million yeah but then it's like but christopher dring says that there's less emphasis on Game Pass. We've seen I don't think we've, we've seen posts from indie developers that the gold rush is over. That Microsoft ain't handing out the contracts like they used to be. So well, think of this, you know, right? Think of this, like regarding Game Pass. You have to presume that Call of Duty and other Activision games are going to have a positive impact on Game Pass. Yeah, you you got to presume that. You would hope. And when, yeah, and you think of this, like when. Call of Duty starts going into Game Pass, and it will. Um, that's going to be a lot of extra money for them to play with, and basically buy support for the hardware. You know, it, there's it, without hardware, there's literally no real point in doing Game Pass. And I think Game Pass, like Phil's described it previously, is a content fund. You know, and it has a huge amount of revenue and a huge amount of money is being made from Game Pass right now. And even more money be made with Game Pass. There's a lot of things they can do to boost Game Pass. And Call of Duty is one of them. ABK back catalog is another one. More perks, more deals. I noticed they put a Riot Games button onto Game Pass on PC recently. Like when um, in the latest update, the latest version of Game Pass for PC, there's a big old Riot, uh, Riot button. There's a big old EA button. So, yeah, I mean, that's how you solve this is by giving devs a reason to invest in the platform via game pass that's why i don't believe there is a de-emphasis on game pass you know 
and um, maybe some indie devs didn't get a game pass bag this time around, but that doesn't mean that there's a de-emphasis, I don't think. I there's mean... reasons to be optimistic, even with all this bullshit going on right now, there's still reasons to be optimistic, and I am overall optimistic. Yeah. Well, we got Phil talking about the handheld. Essentially, he really makes it apparent that he wants one. Um, he says, I just want to be able to boot into the Xbox app in full screen, but in compact mode and all my social experiences there. Like, I want to feel like the dash of my Xbox when I turn the television on, except I want it on these devices because he's talking about like what Lenovo and Asus are doing. It seems like, I don't know, it seems it seems like they're they're setting the ground uh setting like the ground support not the ground support but they're laying the hints down essentially that some xbox handheld is going to be a thing whether it's a year from now or two years from now or three years from now um but i i think the other thing is like is this going to be a native handheld jazz because some people don't believe it yes, some people it believe it's going to be just cloud streaming like the portal. no it's not cloud it's not cloud it's not cloud it's not, not cloud. cloud it's native it's native it's native it's so native. it's so it's native so it's yeah, nice. it really does seem like the handheld is going to be a thing. So I think like next gen essentially is going to be one console, the Series X successor uh, console, and then the Series S successor will be the handheld. And that's what next gen is going to offer. And it's whether that comes in, I think it's going to come in 2026. Maybe it's 2027. I don't see them waiting to 2028, but either way, um, it does seem like the handheld is definitely going to be a thing, which is, it's weird because there've been prototypes before and there, there was one like last gen, but it was like a cloud streaming device. Cause it almost seemed like Microsoft, they're all in on cloud streaming with X cloud, but X cloud has been passed up as like, you know, like G force now is better. Right. And now it's like, Oh, now you're doing now kicks the shit out of cloud. Yeah. Now. And then like, now it's too expensive, man. It's too expensive to be anything more than a, an option right now. That's why they don't market it and they don't push it. And they, they've got their foot in the door for when it gets cheaper and for when Apple gets regulated to fuck. But right now, it's it's not something they're focused on. Na native is basically like way cheaper because it's like you get you get people to run the game off their, their own electricity rather than yours, right? Right now, Apple's not letting that market become a thing. But maybe that'll change in the future because, you know, the Department of Justice has just sued Apple for antitrust uh, in the mobile gaming, uh, mo yeah. mobile industry in general. We've already excellent effect in the super chat with the uh, six ninety nine. Does a game deserve a three out of ten if it's not broken or buggy, but is simply not your kind of game? These ratings by IGN are confusing. Um, I don't know. Good a three, question. A three out of ten to me is this like awful, awful game, regardless of whether it's broken or buggy. I mean, I guess you could say that you know. It's not your type of game, but I don't know. You would think people would use the whole scale. That's why, like, I'll give a game a 10 out of 10. Because if you're not giving a game out of 10, then your scale is essentially a 1 out of 9. But then hardly anybody gives games a 1, 2, or a 3. So what is really your scale? Is it just a 5 to a 9? Right? But then again, I don't know if most people even know what a, a my, 3 my, is. My, my scale is 7 to 10. You know, I don't even, I, I don't even I think don't most, have time to play anything that's lower than the seven. Like, I don't even think most people even have an idea of what an actual three out of 10 video game is. Right. Uh, I do. No. Similar. Well, you know, I do because I play a ton of them, but I'm just saying, uh, a three out of 10. Yeah. Piece of piece of trash. Uh, Joe Repco, a.k.a. Flame, member for 33 months. Good afternoon, Xbox 2. All the news from GDC and even PAX regarding Xbox. Is Xbox's long-term approach hurting them too much in the short term? I guess, yeah, that's a good question, and I think it probably is. Yeah, I think it is. I think I don't think it's worth it. I mean, I think they should have just done Sea of Thieves. The other one's just... Make no sense. Nah, they, they, they should have done. See, I think you could have done Sea of Thieves too. and Grounded. Uh, hi, 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 fi, hi, fi, and Pentiment make no fucking sense. Unless like you were trying to really appease your developers at Tango that really wanted it there or something. But then they're yeah, probably appeasing I mean, Josh Sawyer for putting Pent. Nobody, we nobody 
nobody cares about Pentiment. Nobody cared about it when it came to Xbox. Nobody bought it. Nobody nobody really played it. The same thing. Nobody can play it on Switch. And nobody can play it on PlayStation. It's it's like it's like it's an indie darling that gets good reviews from the reviewers who play it. But honestly, nobody is spending twenty dollars to play that game. No, I hate to say it. It is what it is. Uh, Joaquin Branch says, "What is the world is happening with Ubisoft or at Ubisoft?" Yeah, I saw some of that reporting from Tom Henderson. Yeah, I mean, yikers! I, I, Tom Henderson's report caused a lot of, you know, controversy, and you know, some 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 Ubisoft people quoted it, I think, and and denied it and stuff. But the thing is, I I got a former Ubisoft staffer who who literally li- linked me that article out of the blue and just went, "Yep." Yeah. <laughs> Yikes! Ugh. So you know, it's it's the thing when you're in such a huge big company. It's like everyone can have a com- two people can have a completely different experience working in the same company when there's like a thousand developers working on a game. You know, um, it's why like I'm too nervous to do this kind of reporting because I was trying to do this kind of report for three four three on Halo Infinite, and I spoke to about anywhere between thirty and fifty people about what happened with Halo Infinite and everyone gave me a wildly different story you know and I was just Mm. like I can't build up I can't build up a coherent narrative from all this data you know in good faith you know because I don't know who's telling the truth I'm sure for everyone talking to me it was their truth you know it was their experience and their perception of what happened everyone had someone different to blame you know, or some people blame Microsoft. Some people said Microsoft wasn't to blame, but it was individuals. Some people said different individuals as to blame, you know, and it was crazy. So I was just like, I I just can't, in good faith, put a story out that tries to have a single track uh, narrative because everyone had such a different a, a different um, experience working on that game. But, but the, the universal truth was that no one felt good about it. <laughs> Mm. No, I felt good about it, you know. Um, but anyway, uh, with Ubisoft, I, I, it's the problem when these like really, really big studios that are sort of operating more, more like a factory than uh, a group of creatives being creative. You know, um, that's the downside of the 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 way the industry sort of matured. I think the the industry will mature even further and, and maybe get to a better place because you know. The the thing about the gaming is a weird industry because it's like the the intersection of tech and art, and tech is so volatile. It's changing all the time, and the the way games are made today are going to be different literally next week, and you know the week after and stuff. I you know, I've I've worked in tech. I used to I used to work in web design. And like I took took a break from it, and then I come back, and it's like, oh, every, everyone does everything different now. And then like you take another little break, and it's like, oh, everything's different again, <laughs> you know. And that's that's web design, which is you know potentially far simpler than, um, you know, making a triple A video game. So uh, I don't know. I I just I just ultimately just want the best for everyone involved. You know, the layoffs suck. You know, crunch sucks. Toxic workplaces suck, no matter where you're working. Um, and it shouldn't have to be this way, but that's capitalism, baby. Mm. Randy Johnson capitalism, with the five baby. drops a one-month Peacock membership uh, so people can oh. enjoy WrestleMania 40 next weekend. Love the show, guys. Well, thank you, and hopefully oh, that's really nice. somebody grabbed that one-month Peacock membership. Uh, did, did you watch uh, Raw on Monday? Rock left. Uh, the final boss left. Cody Rhodes bloody i have did he blade oh yeah yeah. cody rhodes bladed oh yeah for sure i thought they didn't do that anymore raw supposed the wwe supposed to be tv pg but they definitely were not tv pg i mean rock was dropping f-bombs really uh, well i mean obviously it was censored but yeah damn we got we're getting back to the attitude era It sort of felt, that F1. segment sort of felt like it i mean um i uh i'm a bit behind i'm i'm like i'm oh, i'm fairly behind i'm like two or three weeks behind i think dragon's dogma 2 man took up so much of my time preparing for that shit are you gonna catch up before uh, wrestlemania next weekend yeah I, I need to i'll probably i'll probably binge it binge watch it tomorrow i guess uh the glasses with the five 
Xbox is just looking very 99 Sega right now, and we are trying to be hopeful that it's not what it looks like. Mm. Yeah. Shout out to the newest member of the channel. We got A Fury West. Thank you. Enjoy the emotes and stuff. We got uh, Jay Rembert with the 10. I own Microsoft stock, but not enough to be on the board. If I was on that board, I would do everything in my power to fire whoever's idea it was to put those four games on PlayStation, no matter whose idea it was. Mm. Okay. We got Supernova with the five. Hellblade 2 is two months left until release and still weak marketing, just tweets. If the game's bad, I can see media going shredded uh, for five-year dev time. I would I would imagine yeah. the marketing will pick up. People have the same thing with Starfield, and then it all sort of hit. Uh, te- you know, games tend to market a lot more when it's closer to release. So Yeah, I don't, what, what games does marketing two months out, really? I mean, especially, like, if it's a game like Dragon's Dogma where, like, they can say like okay here's a trailer for this class and here's a trailer for this class and here's a trailer for this class which is what they did for dragon's dogma every week there was a new there was a new mini trailer for each vocation coming out fine but how do you do that for a game like you know hellblade which is a narrative adventure game probably linear um you know small experience you know ninja theory is still a small team tight knit whatever i think a lot of people are even me i was kind of thinking like oh man this this could evolve to be like xbox's answer to god of war but it's really not. It's just going to be Hellblade 2. That's all it's going to be. It's all it's going to be is Hellblade 2. You don't need a huge months-long marketing cycle for Hellblade 2. You don't need one, you know? Yeah. Um, the marketing, the marketing will pick up, but, you know. It's not, it's not a big game. So, you know, it's a pretty game, but it's not a big game. Uh, Baldy McNose here with the 20. Random Jazz, do you think Xbox is reviving the back compat program? Since now they own Activision. I personally think they are not, since they are shutting down the 360 storefront this July. I mean, the rumor... I think they are. The rumor is that they were going to open up the back and pat and then, like, get some Activision Blizzard games and then, you know, do that. And then... I don't think the back and pat program is going to be, like, officially opened up again, but... Well, the back, the back and pat program isn't going to kill... Um back compatibility Mm. i mean the 360 store shutting down isn't going to kill backwards compatibility because they've ported those games to the the modern store you know or a lot of them i know some of them are on the 360 store or whatever but a lot of them have been updated to be you can purchase them from the new store or whatever um so that that those two things don't correlate but i will say yeah that they are bringing back catalog to game pass and backwards compatibility so there's going to be they are cooking, so stay tuned for that one. Yeah. So let's uh, take some questions from the wonderful patrons over at uh, patreon.com slash xp2. We got the uh, exclusive uh, question and answer thread up here, and we'll let you guys know when we're going to do another Xbox 2 Ultimate or Xbox 2 Plus 1, hopefully next week. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, if you want to support us, this is you know one of the best ways to do so. So if you enjoyed the show, make sure you hit the like button and please subscribe if you haven't already. And for anybody listening to this later on Spotify or iTunes, hello. We love you. You're just as important to anybody that listens to us on YouTube. Make sure to leave us a review or a rating. We'd appreciate that as well. So, uh, yes, this is the Q&A for episode 309. Lazar Wolf, I know Ryan Rand is reluctant to go on cam. He won't be able to eat cookies in the middle of the show. Mm. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't True. have. I didn't have my little four cookies for this. Ha- now I'm hungry because so we're getting there because we're getting to the end of the show. Now I'm. Now I'm, now I'm hungry. So, yes. Uh, Silas says it's June 1991. Rand is graduating high school, and Jez is years away from gracing this planet. In a shocking turn of events, Nintendo and Sony agree to move forward with the S, NES, PlayStation CD add-on. Thus, Sony never went solo into the gaming market. What do you think the gaming landscape would look like today? Would Microsoft be involved? Sega still in the console biz? A different player? Ooh, you're talking about like a uh, like there's a whole different world, a different universe where Sony's not didn't make a console. And does Microsoft even get in? Because one of the reasons they got in was to stop Sony, right, from yeah, dominating the from living room. So, dominating the living room. What would it um, look like? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I don't know. Sega's yeah, probably maybe. still in hardware then, because it was PlayStation that really, really, you know, kicked the shit out of Sega. So maybe yeah. Sega's still there. Maybe, it's I don't really know. hard to say. 
Maybe yeah. I need to I need to like really I don't honestly my my gaming history knowledge isn't that great, to be honest. I um I, I was sort of like I was always a gamer, but I wasn't super, super duper into gaming to the point where I was like, I need to know everything about what's going on in gaming until like I was in my twenties really. So um I'm not sure what I would say there. Maybe some people in the chat have suggestions. Yeah, I don't know. That'd be very interesting. I mean, Nintendo's still around. They're doing their thing. Maybe Sega wouldn't be gone uh, because, you know, PlayStation came in and just dominated right from the get-go. And if that never happened, maybe Sega stays around. And if Microsoft got in because of of Sony, then maybe Microsoft doesn't get in? Or maybe they get in later? Maybe, maybe, maybe Google Stadia? I don't know. Maybe, maybe like Google gets in earlier? Or other companies would get in earlier that you wouldn't think. Mm. That's very interesting how things could be completely different. Yeah. Maybe we'll have to look at like uh, Earth 121 to, to find out, right? Is that from DC? I don't know. Monkey versus Tramp says, Evening Gents, with WrestleMania 40 being a week away, can you both now, live on Xbox 2, Acknowledge the tribal chief Roman Reigns and the wise one Paul Heyman in front of the Xbox community. <laughs> Jez, will, oh, man. will you will you I, throw I up? Like... The, will you throw up the one to acknowledge Roman Reigns as your tribal chief? Nah, no? fuck Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns what? bores the shit out of me, man. I don't like Roman Reigns. I, I don't like Roman Reigns, man. I acknowledge I, I, my um... my tribal chief Roman Reigns and no. the final boss. I appreciate the Rock. I meh. meh. I, I appreciate what Paul Heyman's done for wrestling, but I also, it really annoys me. I think he's really slimy. I know that's his character, but I, I just, he's just, man, he's not Paul Bearer. Bro. Bring All back right. Paul Bearer. That's a good bro, question. From the good, good statement. Hugh says, hello. Or, hola, amigas. My question for you this week is a little spicy. Console warriors often talk about PlayStation exclusives such as God of War, Spider-Man, but never seem to mention the hundreds of games will skip the Xbox platform each year, aka the de facto exclusives. If we take a look at the PC or PS5 section on Gamatsu, we can see so many of these de facto exclusives on display. Why is it they never mention them in their arguments? I understand they are often smaller games, but the sheer volume of games offsets that. Uh, and he gives a l- link. I mean, Xbox talked about that and their whole reasons for why they should be allowed to buy Activision Blizzard. Where like Xbox said they had 50 exclusives and PlayStation had like 280, right? And you know, because I think a lot of those, you know, de facto exclusives are small, right? And either like not good or games nobody's ever really heard of, so nobody uses them in arguments. Because I'm sure those those console warriors are talking about haven't heard of those games, so nobody brings them up. Because it's really about the first party games of PlayStation versus the first party games of Xbox. Not necessarily mm. about games that are exclusive to either one for either, you know, whatever reason, whether it's a money hat or whether it's because, you know, one skipped because they couldn't finish it in time or whatever. And he goes on to say the Polygon interview, if we assume the next Xbox is a console like gaming PC, AKA the steam machine, it would mean they can get access to all these games. Some of which are exclusive to PC this would technically allow Xbox to leapfrog PlayStation with the sheer amount of games available on their system. If this were to happen, do you think PlayStation would stop releasing their games on Steam? No, they wouldn't. No, but I think, you know, further to what we talked about earlier, I think there is some kind of provision where Steam can just be like, allow people to block their game on certain platforms, which is why, like, for example, NVIDIA GeForce Now runs Steam. It's it, that's how it delivers PC games is via Steam, but you can't get your full you can't get your full Steam library on Nvidia GeForce now because it has to be like per developer approval. So you know, um, I don't think, for example, I don't think a lot of PlayStation games are on Nvidia GeForce now because Sony wants people to invest in their cloud, not Nvidia GeForce now. I could be wrong about that, but it's just an example off the top of my head. So yeah, so. If Steam was on an Xbox branded device, PlayStation might just be like, uh, we're blocking our games on that device. Yeah. 
Potentially. I mean, we'll need this. Plus, I don't we think don't Microsoft, I don't think Microsoft this, would even yeah. be able to advertise that, right? Yeah. As like a selling feature of the platform, it would just be like for those that know, no. But it wouldn't be something yeah. that you could say or market to sell a device in any meaningful capacity. I don't think. Yeah. Uh, Gooey Cheese Forty Two. Hey guys, for Jez, I've been so playing so much Dragon's Dogma 2 and I haven't had an RPG grab me like this since Elden Ring. My only real complaint with the game is a lack in enemy variety. Since Capcom owns Monster Hunter, what monster from that franchise would you like to see make a guest appearance in Dragon's Dogma 2? Hmm. Uh, that's a good question. The thing about Dragon's Dogma's monsters is they're all from, generally speaking, they're all from like real myth and legend, which is not the same. Monster Hunter's the opposite. In Monster Hunter, all the monsters are kind of bespoke to Monster Hunter, I think. I mean, apart from when they do these collaborations. I think you kind of upset the lore if you do a guest appearance, but at the same time, when I'm wandering around and there's like random naked pawns that look like celebrities that <laughs> running around in my game, it's kind of like, well, does the law matter that much? I suppose like if we're going to throw that out the window, um, the final dragon that you fight really reminded me of Fatalis from Monster Hunter, but maybe something like completely different. Maybe like, I don't know. Um... Uh... Maybe a Kezu or something. I'd like to see a Ke I like to see Kez Kezu is my favorite Monster Hunter character, so I'd like to see a Kezu in there. Fits the horror theme for certain for like a dungeon or something. Okay. Uh, it's quite small, but smells like a big one. Jez, what happens to Back and Pat if the next Xbox system or systems uses ARM? Does that break everything? Also, do you think the Xbox Go will have full parity with the Series S? Oh, so we're even naming the Xbox handheld now the Xbox Go. Okay. Yeah. That's, a <laughs> that's good actually question. not a bad name, Xbox Go. I actually quite like that name. Yeah, Xbox Go. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think with with when it comes to ARM, now one of the one of the things that the Snapdragon Elite has been bragging about recently is that it can just their emulation layer is so good now that it can just run PC games out of the box. And they were talking about Baldur's Gate 3 running at 60 frames a second on the new Snapdragon X Elite, I think it's called, which is like what the next Surface devices are going to have. They're all going to be Snapdragon based, I think, um, which is a huge, you know, the, if you want an Intel based Surface, you have to buy it through the business store now because the next, the next consumer surfaces, they're all going to be Snapdragon X Elite or whatever it's called. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head. So, yeah, I don't think the whole box will be ARM-based, but I think, like, maybe they'll have ARM cores for certain things. I don't know what exactly, but clearly they're doing something weird. Like, maybe they're going to, like, have AI cores there or something, and I, I don't know, man. I don't know, but it, do, it, does create, it does create some overhead when you have to do emulation. Which is why I think the box, the box itself will still be AMD, I think. But it could have some ARM cores on there to do other things, you know? But we'll see. We'll see. Okay. Uh, we have Omen. Happy Easter weekend if you celebrate. Uh, this week, Diablo 4 was released, but there is no Windows Store integration. It only installs via B Battle.net. One not so well known fact is that the Call of Duty Infinite Warfare and Call of Duty 4 Remastered are actually already on the PC Microsoft Store. So, my question is this Do you think Microsoft will delist the Microsoft ver Store versions and redirect to Battle.net when they add those games to PC Game Pass? Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Call of Duty Infinite Warfare is on the Microsoft Store. I did not know that. And so it's called, yeah, but I think they're the only ones that and COD 4 Remastered. So, yeah. Um,. That's a good question. I, I don't know what they're long... They've probably got a long-term plan in mind for how this all works in the future. Um, I don't I don't think they want to maintain two separate entities. They probably will want to consolidate it in some way in the future. Personally, I think they should just put everything on Battle.net, including Game Pass. 
but um, I, I doubt Microsoft sees it that way. <laughs> I honestly don't know. I don't know what they'll do. Um, we just need to wait and see. It could go either way, I think. Could go either way. Maybe yeah, they just maintain know. both. I don't know how they... I don't know what but they would do in that case. Huge, man. I mean, huge. obviously, you're you going to... just get rid of it. Well, no, obviously, you they, they would, you know, hey, link your Battle.net thing. Maybe it's just, just one of those things where it's like, oh, you can just play these these two. I don't know. I'm, I'm yeah. interested. Like, do you th- when do you think we, we actually get that announcement of, like, because it's, it's, you know, March 28th, and it's like, oh, fine, the Activision game hit, hit Game Pass with Diablo 4. You know, the deal's been, you know, completed in October. Granted, holidays and whatnot, but... They're working on it, man. It's probably not far off. I mean, you say they're working on it, but is, is, is Battle.net integration that complicated? Doesn't really seem like it to me. No, you... I mean, do you mean just for Battle.net games? Well, I... I was talking about IBK back catalog. No, I, I, I mean, like, for adding Call of Duty games to Game Pass, the ones that they potentially could add. Like, what is the holdup on that outside of, like, a marketing uh arrangement of like maybe what's the best time to do it game. well maybe could, maybe that's what sarah bond's little little me- meme was about well, true true know. because i was saying like if you have the battle net integration already up for diablo then it can't be that difficult to get it set up for call of duty games there and the games are already on xbox so mm. you could be like what's the hold up for some of this stuff why is it taking so long when with bethesda they you know most of their catalog was up almost instantly Right, it's about to be April, and you got Diablo Four. You are we gonna have to wait to the summer showcase, or are we gonna have to wait to whatever Sarah Bond's about to tell us in this whatever thing she's re- recording for? Her? I, I'm, you know, there's no seen the the PlayStation version of Halo, dude. I oh, told jeez. You. Um, next question we got. Uh, Pablo says if Microsoft decided to integrate the Play Anywhere p- program with BattleNet, as Jez said in one of your answers in Twitter. I imagine as an idea, not something internal. Xbox would then require up to three accounts, a Battle.net account, an Activision COD account, and Xbox account to have the full Play Anywhere experience, not only entitlement, but cross-progression and cross-play. My question to you would be, do you really think that could be feasible to implement and easy for the users to understand? The current well, Play Anywhere the- is already unknown to many, and this seems to make it more weird. The truth about that is that you can just sign up with an Xbox account on everything. So like when you download Battle.net, you can just click the Xbox button and sign in with Xbox. Same with same with Card, Activision. You can just sign into all of them with Xbox. That's what I do. I just click the Xbox button and sign in my Xbox account on all of them. So yeah, I mean, it creates a separate account kind of. And I suppose it is a little bit annoying to have so many different account systems and platforms and stuff. But... I don't know. Look how long it took them to consolidate Minecraft. So, like, you need a Microsoft account now to play Minecraft. That took how long for them to do? 10 years <laughs> to move people over? Don't expect that to happen soon. <laughs> so, uh, look at Minecraft for an example. So, I don't know. We'll see. Mm. People uh... really want to play a game, they'll figure it out. Sean Kramer says, all the talk around a handheld. No, let's play 4d chess instead first you have your powerful console for couch gaming but then to increase your partnership with epic grow in the mobile market the ultimate cloud experience truly taking your games everywhere the ultimate companion device to your home console introducing the xbox phone obviously no (laughs) but can we imagine oh man if you brought back windows phone Mm. do it i someone someone at microsoft recently suggested to me right that Microsoft won't get rid of Xbox console because they learned their lesson from Windows Phone. And there was a there was an interview last year where Satya admitted that them killing Windows Phone was a big mistake. Because one of the things that they could really do with right now, this second, is a phone platform. Because right now, this second, they have something that could really differentiate them from Apple and Google. And that's AI. Like that, their, their open AI stuff is miles ahead of Apple and fairly ahead of Google. So like this is like this this could have been one opportunity, the one opportunity that Microsoft could have to actually make Windows Phone um, you know, a feasible option. And also the cloud stuff, cloud gaming, that could also make it an option. You know, they could have, you know, even native gaming 
with, with the new Snapdragon chips that are coming down the line and how powerful you, you can have games running on iPhones and stuff. Like they got Resident Evil running natively on an iPhone now. And you, you gotta presume that it'll only get more 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 and more powerful. But Microsoft pulled out. So now they have no skin in that game and coming from so far behind, they'll never be able to catch up. So like even though today Microsoft might be like struggling in the console space. If they pulled out completely, there then there might be a technology or an innovation at some point which really gives them an opportunity to leapfrog, and they'll have pulled out. So I don't think they they'll make that mistake again with Xbox hardware. But unironically, yes, I think they do need to be in mobile. I think they should. I think they should bring mobile Windows Phone back even now. I think they should. Huh. Yeah, I mean, if you want to you want to burn some money go ahead yeah why not yeah i mean do it do it don't you don't have to burn money you can just make it a small platform run run microsoft only apps and services i mean you you, there's, you know there's everything's got a web app now anyway you can you'll already have things like whatsapp and stuff because a lot of that stuff's already on the microsoft store facebook messenger most apps that people use are on the microsoft store now anyway snapchat's there tiktok's there they're all web apps but they work, you know. Bring it back. Fuck it. <laughs> um, Xbox phone. Let's see what I we got know. here. Somebody just sent me a link that showed uh <laughs> that showed uh showed me grounded and Sea of Thieves are beating Destiny pre-orders in the PlayStation Store. Yeah, that's interesting. So I wonder if they'll just like Destiny's uh, dropped off, man, hasn't it? Yeah, it kind of has. Kind of has, right? Mm. Uh, we have Gets since saying, shouldn't Jez have to finish Fallout 4 before he's allowed to constantly complain about having to wait for Fallout 5? That's like saying you're hungry when you have a delicious cheeseburger at your fingertips. Did you not finish Fallout 4? I have finished Fallout 4. Oh, okay. I just didn't do the DLC. I didn't do the DLC. Oh, okay. So, so I have, I reviewed you, Fallout You still 4 have Fallout 4, 4 content to, to do, sir. Yeah, I'm wait. I'm waiting for the next gen update before I do the DLC. But yeah, the DLC didn't exist when I played Fallout Four, and it's honestly rare that I go back to a game just to play the DLC. Personally, well, now you hey, you got the update that that's going to come, so yeah, you might you might want to. Uh, Blaytoven says, if Xbox makes a handheld, would it still require an Xbox Game Pass Core subscription in order to play online games? If so, I don't see any reason to buy it over the other handheld PCs. Not when you can get every single game on there and more and not have to pay for Game Pass. That's a really good hmm. point. Hmm. But I would say yes. And the reason for that is you have to pay for Nintendo Online. And if Sony does a handheld, you probably still have to pay for Sony Online. So I think, yeah. I mean, the, the reason that you would buy it over the other systems is for that ecosystem you know the 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 potentially you know more secure online experience with potentially less hackers because you've got a more locked down environment you know um and also uh you know the the whole social experience and that all the systems there and presumably it'd be priced priced competitively with the steam deck so i think Game Pass Core will still probably be a requirement, but I do see the point there. Um, but yeah, well, so I think it'll still be a requirement. The Rog Ally that doesn't have all your Xbox games, right? Just like the ones in no, the it's win- Windows. It's a PC, so it just has the Windows, the the ones in the Windows Store, and like the ones in Steam. No, it's it's literally, dude. It's it's literally a PC. When you when you open it, turn it on. It, it's it's a PC. It's, so it's, yeah, it so exactly the same you don't need P- you now. don't need a PC uh, Game Pass subscription to play online for those games because they don't require it on PC, right? No, obviously, that's an interesting thing because you would think maybe the people getting a Xbox Go, as I think we're probably going to call it from now on, right? Yeah, uh, Xbox Go probably are existing Xbox users who already have Game Pass, so it would just like your your account would be there, so you already have it. Although, like, when Phil talked about this idea of new users, uh, like, oh, we need to get new users, you need to get new users, is, like, an Xbox Go, an Xbox handheld, actually, what is what is the market for that? Like, is there somebody out there right now who's, like, I'm not interested in an Xbox console, but, oh, they're making a handheld, now I want one. 
Now I want to see what Xbox is all about. Is is an Xbox handheld actually going to bring in a significant amount of new players as Phil keeps on talking about in these things? Or is it just going to be a device for existing it could users? Be the companion. It could be the companion device, you know, your, your Nintendo Switch kind of companion device um, for, yeah. for people. I mean, I think... It's a potentially good combo, you know. If you're someone who doesn't want to buy Xbox games because you're mainly a PlayStation dude, maybe you buy a PlayStation Go, uh, an Xbox Go with with a Game Pass subscription. That's probably the end up being the more cost effective way of doing it. And then you cancel the subscription when you don't when you got nothing to play, and then you resubscribe when you've got something to play. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Achievement says, in reference to some of these studios that canceled their Xbox ports but announced they will come back to them, do you think this is a case where they are obligated due to the fact Microsoft subsidized the dev kits that cost a couple grand each through ID at Xbox to help uh, get games on Xbox? Hmm. That's interesting. Maybe. Right. So if you sign up for ID at Xbox, does that mean that they automatically give you don't know. a console? Or they su- I honestly don't know. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, because there's. I don't a... think I don't think anyone's unless the this you know they can contract it in. I don't think they're obligated to provide an Xbox version, but they're probably like. I reckon that press release probably came across a little bit more blunt than they intended. Maybe, um, it was probably more of a case of like we can't afford to do simultaneous development, so we're going to prioritize one platform now right now, which is basically what Power World Dev said. I said we, you know, we went with went with Microsoft because the server stuff and and uh, we couldn't do development on two different platforms at once. I think they've taken investment from Tencent now, Power World Devs, if I remember mm. correctly. But um, but but yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's a, they're a small dev at the end of the day, and if you don't have a, if you don't, if Microsoft isn't providing you with a financial, a financial, um incentive to prioritize xbox then you're going to prioritize pc and playstation probably you know yeah uh radimus cisco says hello guys i'm a bit out of the loop so i'll just ask about the handheld again let's assume that it's possible to make it but it's still a bit more expensive than the market is willing to pay so it's not considered commercially viable what impact do you think a windows pc xbox handheld would have on the market or on the xbox brand i'm asking because in that scenario i can see them trying to Trying it to some degree, even if the first one is a rebranded third-party product with the partnership. I don't know. I don't know what the impact would be, especially if it's like higher priced. Like, what's the ROG? What's the ROG cost? Six hundred bucks? Uh, it's six ninety-nine, I think. Yeah, and like the Steam for the, Deck for the, Z, for the for the high-end model. There's two models. There's a Z1 Extreme, and there's one that's a hundred dollars cheaper. That's so yeah. I'd... Off the top of my head, but there's a lot of sales going on for it right now because they're imminently going to announce a new one. I think. Yes, yeah, so I don't. I don't know what the market. I don't know how many of those have they've sold. I mean, even the Steam Deck, we don't get numbers about how much that have sold. I mean, you, you the the way Estimates. they. Uh, yeah, they said like multiple millions, but what is that really like? Is it is it still less than ten? I mean, it sounds like the Steam Deck's the biggest thing in the world, but is it really sold that much? Like. If Sony came out with the handheld and only sold 10 million, wouldn't would that wouldn't that be a failure? Isn't that one of the reasons they they stopped the PSP line, right? Is the mobile gaming market really just what the two phone manufacturers and Nintendo, and nobody else is really interested? I don't know. I'm very curious what one if the Xbox handheld is going to be Windows based where you can just launch any launcher on there, or if it would be no, this is just Xbox. And what's the I want pr- my games on it though, right? So it has to be Xbox. So it has to be. I so, said so. And then what's the price point? You know, because now if you have a you have an Xbox handheld out there, guess what? Now you're directly competing with the Switch too, which is going to be three ninety nine. You know, you, you get those comparisons. Mm-hmm. Are those worse or better than the comparisons to the PlayStation Six or Five or whatever? The, whatever, right? That's the thing. It's going to be the the Series S companion because I think they'll still be. There'll still be an option for people who want the high end sit below your TV console. Sure. They'll do both. So, like, in that scenario, it, does it even make sense to compare it to the Switch, which will be the only way to play Nintendo games? Well, I'm just going to say, like, consumers are going to be like, one's a handheld and this is a handheld. They're going to get compared, right? So, yeah. 
what's the price on this one? The price on this one, you know, developers, are they going to be enthused? I mean, about supporting another Xbox device that, you know, that's why it needs to be as well. It needs to be the, it needs to be the, um, the, uh, the series S Q. So that, I don't yeah. So are we going to go through another generation of people saying the series S is holding back gaming again? Yeah. Well, then just say, well, the state is the steam deck holding it back. I don't know. I'm just saying, there's there's a lot there to unpack. Uh, James says, what are the games you've enjoyed the most this gen? As an aside, Ren, play Cyberpunk, it's class. Jez, I found the Magic Archer, and I'm in love. Yeah, Magic Archer. Well, Cyberpunk Ren's will get played. What is th- this whole gen? What is... Th- I mean, Elden Ring comes to mind instantly. Cyberpunk's up there for me, um, definitely. Like, even at launch, playing as a netrunner in Cyberpunk was so much fun. Just making people die via the CCTV, CCTV cameras. So fun. Um, so Cyberpunk's definitely up there for me. Re- Returnal's um, up there for me. Maybe not like super high, but Returnal's probably my favorite PlayStation exclusive. Um, i trying to think. Uh, I just put myself that for me as well. Resident Evil 4. Very, very recent. Resident Evil 4 is up there for me. Resident Evil 8 for me. Ooh, Village. Um, yeah, I absolutely love Resident Evil Village. So good. Um, such a such a large amount of variety in that game. You know, for, like considering it's like just a horror game, they do a lot of different kinds of horror in that game. There's like there's like a a true sort of like oh, you've got no weapons, you you hide in from you know you're hiding from enemies instead section there's more action oriented sections the sections that are more classic resident evil in the mansion like that it's like a homage to every version of resident evil in that game i absolutely love resident evil village i thought it was amazing yeah. um um yeah alan wick 2 so, alan wick 2 is up watched, there for me so i've watched two counters next gen <laughs> yeah. uh man um sierra 11 kevin i'm generally content with the xbox passing on a pro console this gen however i would like them to give more details on future hardware at the summer showcase maybe to counter matches the counter message the ps5 pro they can have a scissor reel highlighting some of the better graphic games sh- shown saying you can play these soon on the series console maybe even highlighting a, a console price drop but after that to end the show they say and also next gen starts in 2026 and they have a shadowy silhouette of a handheld dock console and a Series X style second console. Do you think that would be enough to calm current Xbox fans and perhaps slow down jumping over to the PS5 Pro? Hmm. Well, certain I don't know. certain Xbox fans are only going to be calmed if they came out and they said we are not putting any more of our games on PlayStation and Switch. Yeah, I think so too. There's there's a segment of Xbox fans who that's the only way to like calm them down. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if like revealing that we got hardware coming is going to calm everybody down, you know, but I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely something you could do to be like, Oh, by the way, they did it. Cause they sort of did it with the one, the Xbox one X. They, they announced it at E3 2016 and they said, Hey, this, this eats monsters for breakfast. Right. Or whatever, you know, because they did the whole thing with all the developers, like Ibarra and Cream Chowdhury and stuff. And it was like, oh, Project Scorpio. And they did that knowing that even though it was coming a year later, the PS4 Pro was coming that holiday. So it was like, hey, hey, you know, we got something better coming in a year. And, you know, could they do something like that? Where they say, hey, in two years, I still to announce something two years out is, is I think, too much to, to, to do. Honestly, yeah, I don't know. Um, but I don't. I like the hard. I think at some point, it's not it's about the hardware. It's about the games. I think people are just like, all right, because it's all been about the games, and it's like you've been you've been talking about the games forever, and where are they? And you showed all these games from twenty twenty. It's like, when am I going to play those? Rather than like, the extra hardware. Or when when's the hardware coming? You know. Yeah. I don't know. They have their work cut off for them, so we'll see. Uh, Subeg says, I have a simple question. In your opinion, how do you guys see AAA single-player games evolving in terms of gameplay loops? AAA games seem to follow the same narrative exploration combat loop for years now. 
One way I can think of is having more engaged traversal. Hope you two have a wonderful day. Yeah, AAA games haven't really evolved much since the 360 era. That's pretty much set the standard for AAA gamings that most of these developers have followed ever since. And you don't get a lot of variation. They added in like crafting or like, hey, you know, we need to pick up some of these items and then we'll craft stuff to that loop of cutscene, exploration, combat, cutscene, exploration, combat that a lot of games do uh, go for. But then those games are really successful. This industry loves the copycat stuff. So it's only... But there's only so many ways you can interact in the game anyways. Like, there's only so many buttons on a controller. There's only so many things you can do. I, I don't know. I don't I don't really see AAA games evolving much more than what they currently are, to be honest. I think... I, I mean... I know no one wants to hear this, but AI probably has some kind of role oh, to play there. AI. Oh, God. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I mean, undoubtedly, AI has some role to play in you know generating content you know interaction with npcs making more realistic npcs that you know like some sometimes the pawns in dragon's dogma 2 will do things that i think is really uncanny it's like oh wow the, how did the pawn know to do that you know like that that you can send them to climb up a a ledge that your vocation can't access and they'll go up there and throw the ladder down for you i think oh that's really cool you know i do wonder like more intelligent party members is probably one thing that they could reason reasonably do with ai technology but the problem is there when you are using the ai technology that way every interaction comes with a dollar cost attached to it because you've got to pull the data down from the cloud presumably so yeah i don't know man um there probably needs to be a technological breakthrough um you know i, I think like with, with regards the big bottleneck for artificial intelligence right now is how much power it consumes which makes it which puts a limit on how viable it can be as a business because it's so expensive to generate that those tickets but if there was like a clean energy breakthrough, like fusion, nuclear fusion technology or whatever, you know, all that, all the sci-fi kind of crap, um, maybe then gaming can evolve even more, you know, for, for, for a while, everyone thought like VR and the metaverse kind of stuff would be the next big leap for gaming, but it's just too uncomfortable. A lot of this, a lot of this technology just has some kind of downside or drawback or, or bottleneck to really be in you know, pro proliferating. So maybe, maybe at least for the foreseeable, AAA gaming is just going to be like more refined versions of what, what we've got now, where it's like the visuals get better, the effects get better. Um, they had know, ray and... tracing, so it looks better or whatever. But yeah, it's, like, but it's not actually the, changing the formula the advanced... of, of how yeah. you interact, though, or what yeah, the loop is. For, def for definite, you know. Um, Interactions have probably come with AI down the line, you know, but again, too expensive right now. So it's interesting to think about. Yeah, Darian Crago says, hey guys, hope you're uh, both well. Do you think Xbox should go in a direction that will appeal to the broader gaming majority or appeal more to the more appeal more to the hardcore gamer like the ones that listen to the podcast? Which is better for longer longevity? Hmm. In theory, you do both. In yes. theory, you've got you've got you've got a market, you know, and and that's why you know they did the Series S in the first place. It was like we we can tap a market where they only really want to play Fortnite. You don't need a high end console to play Fortnite. Maybe the Series S for most people. For a, for a hardcore Fortnite player, Series S is probably the best console for you because you you know you don't need to play Fortnite 4K for God's sake, and it runs the game at 60. You can do it for free. You don't need you don't need Game Pass Core to play Fortnite now. So you know you that is probably your best option, right? So I kind of think Microsoft's trying to do both. I don't know how you appeal to the hardcore these days. You know the hardcore like the wants doesn't just want great games. They also want to feel good about the platform they're using. I don't think Microsoft's done a great job about making people feel good to be Xbox fans at the moment. Um, but 
I think they should do both. Let's see. That's the real answer. Dude. And I don't think I don't think that's a lot to ask for. Dude, look at this headline from PC Gamer. They did it again. Oh. Phil Spencer blames capitalism for games industry woes. "Quote: I don't get the luxury of not having to run a profitable gaming business." <laughs> <laughs> blames capitalism for game industry woes. Interesting choice of a headline, wouldn't you say? That is an interesting one. Yeah. Uh, we got, I don't know. I, I think, yeah, like just, I, I think like if you, you appeal to the hardcore, also appeal to the broader gaming majority. I think, I think you kind of appeal to both really. Yeah, I do both. Uh, Donataku goes, what's up y'all? Xbox is fine. Listen and greenlit your dream game with infinite budget and it's guaranteed a 90 plus a Metacritic and everything you wanted. However, you have to get rid of three of the following Xbox-owned franchises forever to fund it. Halo, Gears, Forza, Fable, Elder Scrolls, Fallout, Pillars of Oud, Warcraft, Starcraft, including World of Warcraft, Overwatch, Doom, Dishonored, Wolfenstein. What game are you making? What three franchises have to go? All right, well. Goodbye, Forza. Goodbye, Fable. Goodbye, hmm. Dishonored. All right, that was well, easy. goodbye, Pillars and Avowed. Goodbye, Warcraft and Starcraft. Uh, goodbye, Overwatch. Wow. What game would I make? Oof. It's an interesting question. I'm not a very creative person, so I don't I don't even know what I would really want. Um, I'd make Pillars 3. You can't. It's gone. Pillars of Oud, no more. Not, not, in my, not in my universe. Yeah, your universe I is give, a Pillars 3. I give 3. that budget, even though he hates me, I give that budget to Josh Sawyer. And I'd have him make Pillars free. Interesting. It, with a billion dollar budget. You know what? Screw it. I'm bringing back Quantum Break. We're doing Quantum Break 2. We're going to save Beth. And nice. we're doing it, bro. That's what I'm doing. But we're getting rid of Warcraft, Starcraft, Overwatch, and Pillars and Avowed to do so. No. Sounds like a fair trade-off, right? No, that's an awful trade-off, bro. Uh, Lee Sanders says, great to see you both on the X-Cast this week, lads. Keep up the fantastic work. Any plans on Xbox 2 merch? We actually do have an Xbox 2 merchandise store, and you can buy them from Rand's channel. And if you go on Rand's channel and on the store tab, there is some Xbox 2 merch there. Actually, there is a, a metal shirt that i put on there and i forgot to tell anyone about it <laughs> i had sean the do a, an xbox 2 logo in the style of like old school metallica and i don't think i ever told anyone about it so uh, if you want xbox 2 merch there is some stuff up there there is um, we, we do got to come up more more like t-search design and stuff so yeah oh we got a late I we got a couple like... late entries here jess we got good old collinwood oh. saying hey happy easter ran and jess Ren, have you seen the three body problem yet? Jez, time to go weeaboo. Have you seen Netflix's dr dungeon meshy? Do you reckon Ran would enjoy this fantasy dungeon crawling anime? Dun dungeon. I don't. He doesn't even know what you're talking about. But yes, I have watched Three Body Problem. I watched the one. Sorry, go on. I watched Three Body Problem the night it came out. I watched five episodes and I watched the, the three the next day. I mostly enjoyed it. As someone who really enjoys the books, I thought most of the changes were for the better, uh, considering, especially if we're trying to position it to a mass market audience. Oh. Um, it did feel a little bit disjointed towards the end. Uh, it felt like episode five was the culmination of the season, where episodes seven and eight were starting like a new storylines. Um, everybody that I've talked to on uh, my friend group that really uh started watching it as well they they all really enjoyed it too so everybody i've talked to has liked it i'm just hopeful that uh we get a second season uh, at least to get the adaptation of the dark forest because ooh, the dark forest is crazy so yes um but have you i i do know I, it's called delicious in dungeon i think right I have actually watched one episode of that. I watched it at my friend's house, and it is really good. I need to watch more of it. Speaking of being a weeb, I did finish Cyberpunk Edgerunners today, and mm -hmm. it's incredible, and I am now depressed. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. We do got a question. Uh, it's kind of from Governor Grimm. 
but he posted it into the uh, the video thing. So I'll just read it to you, Jazz. He says, Jazz, you stated in a stream that Xbox leadership thinks all the conversation is just talk and people won't actually abandon their digital libraries. Is that how they actually think of things? I think like, I'm not sure if I use those exact words, but Phil said himself, it was kind of funny that people won't switch platform anymore, no matter what they do, because people have sort of locked in with their digital libraries and stuff. But I will say, like, I think there is a limit. You know, I think if if Xbox stopped delivering hardware and high quality hardware, and if they stopped delivering high quality games, and there was you know nothing cool coming to Game Pass, like even I would start moving gradually over to PlayStation. You know. Because they'd be like, well, they're giving me what I want as a aging millennial gamer who wants a more traditional console experience, you know. Right now, it, it feels like, um, you know, that's where you're going to get that experience, you know. Whereas Xbox is constantly changing direction, constantly, and constantly changing their messaging and, you know, and talking probably too much and, you know, confusing everyone about what their plans are, like saying like we're gonna you know and teasing instead of being explicit because it's too early to talk you know um whereas sony's off offering beautiful simplicity and uh familiarity even though like playstation will evolve too they're not talking too much about it because they don't want to confuse everyone um so yeah i think there is a limit on how much i think microsoft knows there is a limit to how much bullshit people will put up with even mm. even in that scenario but i don't know we'll see if people really do uh move on or not um right now they don't think the the four games on playstation has negatively impacted xbox but we'll see what happens if they do more right on uh, the super chat we got rrd with the two do you feel like the xbox hype train is dead I mean, it's definitely it's like definitely, <laughs> definitely, it's definitely slowed way down for sure. Yeah. Now, whether it remains that way forever is, you know, something we'll just have to see. Yeah. Uh, Scarecrow, one twenty one member for forty nine months. Wow, another month of membership. Good work on the Xcast boys, and you have to get Snowbike Mike for Xbox Two Plus One. We definitely will. I did ask him. I, I did tell him. I was like, Mike, I need you for Xbox Two Plus One, and he said. He would love to, so we just need to work that out. We're definitely going to get Mike on at some point, and that was that was great doing doing X Cast uh, with him. So, uh, but Jez, I think I'm going to look through my notes because we're almost up on the uh, four hours here. I just want to make sure that we covered everything that I had written down. Um, yeah, I think I think I think we have. Yeah, so. Yeah, that's been episode 309. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, hit the like button, subscribe if you're new. Uh, check out the Patreon at patreon.com slash xb2. If you're listening to this on the audio platforms like Spotify and iTunes, uh, we appreciate you. Hope you're en enjoying it. Listening to your car or wherever you listen to stuff, leave us a, a review or a rating. That really helps out. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have some for, we'll probably, if we don't get somebody for Xbox 2 plus 1 this week, we'll, we'll probably definitely do an Xbox 2 Ultimate. Um, I'll, I'll work on getting someone as a guest uh, for soon. But yeah, I just want to thank everybody for being here. You're all the best. Xbox community, uh, the XB2 community is uh, it's always, it's always uh, fun to read the posts and the discords and in the chat here for the uh, the podcast. So yeah, I don't know what else to say, Jez, other than hope you have a great weekend and keep it gaming, right? Hell yeah, happy Easter, and check out my No Rest for the Wicked preview pinned to my Twitter, yeah. if you're interested. Dude, we're going to have some ham and mashed potatoes and broccoli casserole for Easter. It's going to be it's gonna be a good one. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to sleep and but sleep and sleep. But until then, we'll see you next week, guys, for episode 310. Later. Rock and roll, baby.